few months later, I was in prison myself in, um, uh, for assault and three Commonwealth police. Uh, they bashed up my uh, brother-in-law, so I jumped out and flogged them and then couldn't help myself, as usual, and uh, got a big rock and uh, caved one of their heads in with the rock. And uh, anyway, I ended up going to prison for it for a few years at uh, Parramatta Jail. G'day ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Cancel Me Now podcast. My name's Isaac Butterfield and this episode is going to be absolutely insane. We have on the show a notorious gangster, a man who lived a life of violence and crime and now tells those stories. His name is Graham Abbo Henry. He is a man that was feared in the streets of Australia, particularly in Sydney and New South Wales throughout the 80s and 90s. A very interesting character, a gentleman, but definitely someone who in his day and perhaps now you don't want to cross. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a great chat. Before we get into the show, this show is brought to you by the great people at manscaped.com. Manscaped.com has been a sponsor of this podcast since its inception and on my YouTube channel. Ladies and gentlemen, Manscaped has the best products that you've ever seen to Manscape your everything. Now, it doesn't it, it starts with the Manscaped Lawnmower 4.0. To head down south and make everything absolutely look in order, ladies and gentlemen, but now they have something absolutely incredible, a brand new product that will make you scream with joy. It is the Manscaped brand new boxer briefs. These guys are absolutely beautiful, absolutely insane and stunning styles and colors for every occasion. Let me tell you that. I am wearing them right now and I tell you what, they are the most comfortable, the best, the most breathable. The... They've got this pouch at the front that holds your bits and gear, and it is absolutely unbeatable. Ladies and gentlemen, manscaped.com forward slash Butterfield is the place to go to get those. And if you go to that link, it is down below. You will also get two free gifts and free international shipping plus 20% off. Ladies and gentlemen, manscaped.com, proud sponsor of this podcast, and I love them. The best. The bee's knees when it comes the men's grooming. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my conversation with Graham Abbo Henry. We met through Gary Jubal. We were we in uh, where were we? we were in Newcastle. Newcastle. Massive yeah. show that Gary did there. I was blown away. And for people who don't know who Gary is, he is uh, best known for being the lead detective on the William Tyrrell case, where a that's, young boy uh, yeah. went missing. And he uh, he's been thrown through the ringer. This week, or well, last week, but probably the most. I rang him during the week, actually. Yeah, yeah, so did I. And he said, mate, it's full on. It's full on. So, you know, we're thinking of Gary at the moment because yeah, he's a right. very, very good gentleman. Yeah, he's copping some. For, for a bloke who's trying to find a kid. Yeah, exactly. It d- does my fucking head in. Yeah. But um, thank you, sir. I appreciate right, your time. And, and no we, we met backstage uh, we at, at Gary's show. And I wasn't familiar with you. Uh, but I looked, I looked you up because he, because he said you got to come and meet Graham. I went there. Hey Graham, how are you, brother? And I looked you up in the car. I was like, fucking Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and then I listened to some stories. Uh, I listened to your interview with Gary on Gary's podcast, How to Catch yeah. Killers, and uh, also with Gypsy Tales. That's right. Yeah. And he's got a great show as well. Yeah, yeah, and- he's. Uh, he- He's had a massive follow on that. Yeah, yeah. He's um and obviously people know who Gary is, but yeah. Gypsy Tales, go and go and check out Gypsy Tales. Yeah, Great podcast. Good, yeah, it's a good one. Mate, your story is fascinating. And obviously that's a weird thing to say to someone who's lived it. Yeah. But but it certainly is fascinating. Yeah. You've lived lived a very violent past, or you've very. had a very violent past. Yep. I know that you've spoken a lot about your childhood. And I'd like to get into that today yeah. as well because that, right. that's very interesting and obviously extremely traumatic but yeah. very interesting. You have a book out at the moment? I do. It's called Last Man Standing. Yep. I uh, released one uh, first in 2006, which was called A Treacherous Life. Well, this is virtually the same book uh, because I had a big calling for it and uh, then I a- added some chapters that have been put to it for okay. that and yep. we called it Last Man Standing. So. Uh, that's for sale now. You can get it at a treacherouslife.com. And, uh, mate, it's, uh, it's the truth. I tell it how it is. You know, there's no 
my life's an open book, mate, so, you know, anyone wants to double-check anything I've ever done, all they've got to do is look me up. So you can get that book on that website? Yeah, That's the best place there, to grab yeah, it? Yeah, and I'll sign it straight away. You, so you so, sign it for people yeah, as well? Yeah, yeah, I sign them all, yeah. Fantastic. Now, I guess we should go to the start. I oh, know. Uh, because I feel like a lot of people in the 80s, 90s know your name. Yeah. Uh, the younger folk, maybe not so much. Yeah. I was born in, in 93. That's right. So I wasn't 100% across what happened. People like Nettie Smith and Roger yeah. Rogerson, I know of the names, but I'm, I don't really know the story. So I'd That's like right. to get into that as well. Yeah, no worries. How does someone become one of the most notorious gangsters in Australia's history? I don't know, mate. Uh, you know, I, I always said... Ever since I've been a young bloke, I was I was a bit intrigued with that. I used to watch The Untouchables a lot with me mother, which was a show that was on every Friday night. So, and uh, my old man would be out somewhere on the piss or whatever, and so my my mother and I would sit down as a kid uh, from you know seven years of age right through till I was probably about twelve or something when they stopped doing it. And uh, she was in love with Elliot Ness, who was the copper, and uh, and I liked all the crooks. <laughs> And I thought, well, look, they've got the life, these blokes. And I just, I just love the adrenaline of it. And um, unfortunately, I sort of I sort of just loved it. I loved that sort of thing. And I had it in my mind all the time. I can remember even as a kid even thinking this when I was about 14, my life's like a movie. Mm. You know what I mean? And if I'm given a part, I'm going to play it the fucking best I can. And, uh, you know, and unfortunately... Everything I tried to do that was legal, you know, even working, you know, and I worked hard jobs, you know. I carted bricks, I had my own brick trucks, you know, I carted meat, I carted furniture, pianos, you know, I did all the heavy lifting, yeah. uh, de- all that sort of stuff, but everything would fall on its ass, or, you know, it'd go broke the business or, you know. And uh, even tried male modelling. I tried uh, uh, being a professional singer. Because I, I, I've seen photos of you on your wedding day. You're a good-looking man back in the day. Yeah, like well, ha- you had ago. it. You had it. That was a while ago. So. But but yeah. still, <laughs> mate, you had it. And to think like you're living this this gangster life too, yeah. like there would have been ladies coming yeah. out of the woodwork. Well, I didn't and- have that look that a lot of blokes have got, I guess. And I, th- I think people perceive a gangster to, you know, have this big horrible-looking head yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, be like a big gorilla. I was pretty big in me day as I got on, you know, but uh, I got up to 110 kilos. But Shit. You know. Um, but uh, then I got diabetes at 50 and okay. then I lost uh, a, a heap of the weight through that and mm. plus the training I do, you know, which is a lot of boxing and mm. stuff like that. But I haven't done that for a while either. But, look, getting back to that, I just loved it. I used to have a picture of Don John Dillinger on my wall with a big machine gun under his arm. And uh, my you know, every, most kids that have pictures of you know Rack Old Welsh or you know all the glamours yeah. or all the shows, you know, yeah. And I had racing cars, and right in the middle was John Dillinger, you know. So that was my go. Well, I, I always just, I, I either wanted to be a Formula One driver or a uh, or a gangster, and I guess I just everything I did led me into that path. You know, I really did, you know, with the crimes I started doing as a teenager. And because I was booted out of home, you know, I left home because of the violence in my house. And uh, and I just lived on the streets. I lived in parks. I lived in um, tree houses in kids, kindergarten schools, really? uh, drains, you know. I le- uh, did all that sort of stuff. I used to have a mate come down and feed me every morning, uh, you know, Give me something that his mother had made up for me. Or, and how old were you at this stage? Uh, I was probably about uh, 14, 15. So you were just desperate yeah, I'd for just shelter. Left, I've left school at 14. Yep. I had to get an exemption to leave. Yep. And I was 14 and uh, and uh, I tried, uh, I got an apprenticeship as a uh, wall and floor tiler. And uh, that only lasted for a while until the boy, until the uh, the bloke called me something like Boy Akani or something like that it was in Italian and, I was walking across this uh, big building site at North Ride one day that I was working on and uh, this builder pulled me up and he said, do you know what he's calling you, mate? I said, no, he said, dirty dog. So I said, oh, is he? So I stole his uh, falcon, got a brand new falcon, you know, with the old nod, nod, nodding dog in the back and yeah, pom-poms yeah, yeah. all around. <laughs> That's how the Italians used to have it. So I pinched his car and wrote Carney all over it. And I don't even know if I spelled it right, but... <laughs> 
you know. You got your point across. But yeah, I got the point across and uh, left the job. And, uh, mate, I, all I ever did was been oyster and stuff, you know. Like I've been, I can remember at five and six, go, going into my neighbours' houses while they were away and, you know, they going through rattling rattling all the money out of the money boxes and, the, you know, stealing purses, oyster. And then I got brought from school for... Uh, pinching uh, money out of the teachers' purses, like mm. I'd take five pound notes and and go and buy all the kids' toys, and but I can always remember one thing. Now I was only probably five or six years of age. I lived at Sylvania Heights at this stage, and uh, and there was a big stud farm near us, just near Rockley Crescent on on the on the Princess Highway there, and uh, I told all the kids at school. I don't know where this come from in my head. But I said, uh, my uncle owns that stud farm. I said, you can have a horse, but you've got to get me a pound each. Mm. Well, a pound in those days, well, you know, $2 or whatever it is today, you know, uh, in the old currency. And uh, and they were in notes in those days, not coins. And uh, so next minute I got these kids all sitting up on the fence with a pound each in their hand. And I said, well, all you've got to do is, and I knew the bloke because I used to sit up on the fence of an afternoon and wave at him. Yeah. And he'd wave back at me, right? Yeah. So I, I had it right on cue. It was like <laughs> I was already planning stuff then. Yeah. And so this bloke come up and um, I could see him down there, so I waved at him and I said, that's my uncle, yeah. you know. And, they, and I said, all those horses in that paddock, you can go and have one of them, just walk down there. And I said, give us the money. As soon as they give me the money, I hightailed at home. I thought that was a good plan. <laughs> I forgot about the getting away part. It's always the most important part. Did he catch uh, up with you? So naturally, well, he didn't. But the uh, all of the uh, I went to school, of course, on the the next day, and uh, next minute, all the mothers were there, and uh, <laughs> you know, because he'd taken them home, this bloke, and said, "This kid's roared at them." <laughs> and uh, anyway, I got into a heap of shit over that. I remember getting caned, so and it never happened in that part of the school, like because I was still in the junior classes. Mm before it got even into third class. Right. You know, so that's how young I was. Wow. So, uh, you know, so that's how my mind was thinking then. So God knows what you said. Know, so I well, was always an organiser, so. When you're 14 and you're sleeping in a drain, does that does that just come to, you know, dusk or night time and you're just like, I just need somewhere to lay? Yeah, yeah. And you just sort of, what, pull yeah, the drain just, out? Or? Yeah, I'd just go down and just, uh, you know, where there were big, Canals, they were canals. I'd just go down the canal, you know. I'd have a couple of blankets or something I'd get from somewhere. Uh, I'd just put one underneath me, one over the top of me, and away I'd go, you know. I've got a mate of mine who is very successful now, but when he was a kid he was homeless and living yeah. on the streets. And he said the number one thing that he went, when he went to people's houses and broke in, and he said, listen, you can have as many security systems as you want. If I want to get in, I'll get in. Yeah. He said the number one thing I looked for in people's houses was milk. Yes. He loved milk. Yeah, that's and he, right. He was yeah. just like, that's the like yeah. that that's the source of that's all the it. nutrients and the protein. That's right. Is that a like a well known? Well, it was delivered in those days yeah. and just put over your fence. Um, yeah, you know. So you know, I did the same thing. So yeah, right. That's you know, very interesting. And as soon as the delicatessen opened up, up up at Epping Station in Langston Place, I used to just walk in there, walk around while there was people in there, and just start stuffing biscuits down me. Shorts and, yeah. you know, whatever I could, you yeah. know, to roll a Devon or whatever it was. Whatever you can get your hands on. Yeah, but, uh, you know, some of the council blokes used to look after me. I had a bag with all my clothes in it and they'd always just come in. I ended up finding this um, a room that was like a they'd put all the cricket mats in and uh, there was all the toilets there and all the poofs used to get down there. That was the worst part about it. Yeah. So I had to wait till really late at night before I could go down there, otherwise they'd come in and annoy me and... You know, and I'd get up and hook into them or, you know, or put something in them if I had to, you know, because I've had to do that a few times. Mm. And uh, and I hated them because I was molested in boys' home, so right. in, in the boys' shelter. And, uh, you know, that had a pretty bad effect on me about people like that. But hey, that's naturally, as I look back, I I know that homosexuals aren't pedophiles. No, yeah, you know what I mean? Course, but, of course. But you didn't think like that as a kid. That's so common so, in those boys' you know, homes. Oh, mate. It's madness. That was crazy. It's, well, especially the place I was, they used to bring the pedophiles in there. Fuck. They used to bring them in off the street, you know. I don't know what the go was, if they were paying them or not. I don't know. But oh, it, it's so I've right got a lawsuit that. going with that at the moment. Okay, so, okay. you know, I'll just – I can't really talk too much about that sort of stuff. But um, 
it certainly had an effect on me. Of course. And I, and I, uh, and I, I was just good at covering over everything. I covered over everything for years and years and years. Even when I've been married, I've never told my wife. I, she knew something happened to me, but mm. she didn't know what or mm. how bad it was. And it was bad. Mm. And, uh, and it affected me. But, and I know it affected me in, in the violent way, you know, and that's how I, I expressed it. I guess every time I did it, you know, I, I, I created violence somewhere. Mm. Uh, it was more likely that than the upbringing I had in a household where my father used to bash my mother all the time. Like, you know, he'd punch her up like a prize fighter. He wouldn't uh, just slap her or pull mm. her hair or, you know, he'd flog her. Mm. You know, and shouting, I had one leg, my mother. Mm. So, you know, he was pretty brutal. So from the age of 13, I was punching on with him. And I uh, used to get on the grass and try and fight him and, um, and uh, you know, he'd always beat me until I got about 16 and then I, I battered him really bad one night and uh, for flogging my mother to a pulp and I found her under the house all covered in blood and she had big blood clots on her, you know. He'd give her a really bad serve and uh, I just had enough and I run straight in. He was in her bed for some reason. They'd never slept together for years. And he jammed up all the door because he must have known I was going to come home. So I come home and uh, kicked the door in and dragged him, flogged him out of the bed, bashed him in the bed on the floor. And uh, then I went out into the kitchen and got a barbecue fork and come back and started stabbing him. So, uh, you know, my intention, I guess, I mean, Gary Jiblin asked me the same thing. What was my intention? I said, well, my intention was to finish him. Mm. You know, because we put up with it all our life. Yeah, it My wasn't an isolated Ryan, incident, incident you know. law. And, uh, you know, he was a brutal bastard. Mm. So, but, you know, uh, I mean, I can look back now in reflection and look back and, and just think what a shit time he had in his life too. I mean, you know, he'd come back from the war, knocked on the door of his house and uh, found out that um, another bloke answered the door after he'd been away fighting for the country for four years. Yeah. Uh, so he left that family and then married my mother. And then I come out of a, a uh, an affair that my mother had uh, with, with an Indigenous man mm. around the Sutherland Shire area. And um, and uh, I didn't find that out until I was 65. But it was funny because from the age of 14, all my mates called me Abba. Okay. You know, because I had the skinny legs, the flat nose, the, the dark skin. And uh, it just stuck with me. And uh, so that's where that all come from. And... Uh, but all that, all that violence that come out of me and all that life, I think, you know, was, was, was everything really that came from my upbringing from the way my father was. But it taught me, you know, to respect women. And I've never ever in 48 years ever laid a hand on my wife. I was just talking about the mat on the way in, mate. And, uh, and I just said, uh, you know, no, I've never done it, you know. But uh, I, I, I could never bring myself to it, you know. There's nothing like I think they're just weak. Because you could have gone. Dogs that do, what, do it. 100%. You, know? you could have gone either way. You see that at home, then maybe yeah. you emulate it later oh, in life. Oh, exactly. I mean, a lot of people do that. You know, it's the same as people who get molested and that. Uh, mm. They end up being molesters themselves. Well, you know, that was going to be far from my calling, mm. you know. Um, I always just had. I think because my mother was so strong a person, um, I sort of emanated that, you know. Uh, I became strong. I might, it didn't mean that I had to be the toughest bloke on the street or anything like that, but uh, I was always strong inside, mm. you know what I mean. So I, I could tolerate a lot of crap and uh, I could put up with it. So I thought I, I probably fitted into the life I was going to lead pretty well, mm. you know. I think I was just wide for that life. Mm. And uh, as I said to Gary when I left it, when I finally decided that enough was enough, I sort of went into depression. You know, I started having anxiety attacks and all sorts of stupid stuff. So uh, I ended up going to a doctor's one day and he pulled everyone's head off in the place if they were going to jump in the line in front of me. I was that spun out. Mm. Was yeah. that because you were you had left the life and yeah, it just yeah. wasn't that? Yeah, just uh, I was just that was I guess it's like a footballer, yeah. you know, leaving his career or uh, 
and I, all of a sudden they go, well, what am I going to do now? Yeah, I think it's you know similar I mean? to people in the well, army and yeah. the, the return service well, my, people. my son was in it, you know. He, really? He was a commando in the army. But um, uh, but, I, but I've known a lot of soldiers like that, you know, mm. and I, I went and did this thing as I was going through this thing that's called NET uh, and kinesiologists do it. But it's a, it's like works on your consciousness, mm-hmm. right? So they just ask you questions, hold your arm up and then go through certain emotions in you and all of a sudden your arm might drop and say, what happened to you at the age of five? And you go, um, and then they'll go through the emotions, touch your arm and they'll say, uh, you know, was it violence? Did you just bang, the arm would drop. I say, what did you see at five? And all of a sudden it just comes to you. Uh, it's an amazing thing. Anyway, I went there for a few months to a bloke over in um, uh, North Sydney and he was absolutely brilliant. But when I got there, he said, you've got to put your finger in this computer. And uh, when I did it, he said, mate, I've done all the war veterans and everything. And he said, your, your body's in the same place, mm. you know. So mine just went straight off the Richter scale when I was doing it, you know. And he said, you're the highly... You Strong, know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. And I was like it all my life, really. But how could you not be? Yeah. You know, you, every right. day you come home, you're worried about your ma being bashed. Yeah. You, you Then, you know, you're on out, out on the streets and you're yeah. worried about things happening. Or you've got to find a place to sleep. And then for the rest of your life, you're yeah. an enforcer. I, yeah, that's right. So, and, and, and I'm in a different, you know. And as I say, you know, I used to start my car with a broom handle sometimes, you know, during all the gang wars and things like that to make sure I wasn't going to get blown up with a car started. So... You know, I was vigilant 24-7 and probably still am today. I mean, you know, I look at everything. I, if I see someone sus, bang, I'll come back past them. I'll, you know, I'm all over them. So that's just the way I'm wired, you know. Well, we're seeing that with and, the gangland shootings that are happening at the moment in Sydney. Yeah. You know, people are getting shot. But at, they're just hectic gym. stuff, you know. They're, yeah. they're, they're hectic shootings. I mean, they're just, that's just, they're just, but uh, one of the one of the main things of the organised crime that I was involved with was if you start taking it into the public, mm. you know, and just shooting up houses and as they do the other day, day. Yeah. They're a, and, you know, and they're doing it right out the front of the gyms and all. And I'm not saying that people didn't get knocked in the street mm. in our day because they were left there for a reason, so as a warning to other people in organised crime. But we never took it out into the public and sprayed up houses or shot their mother and then killed their brother because he was, you know what I mean? So that's the difference in what there is today, you know. So yeah, the, uh, the police have got a big job on their hands mm. these days. So. But, you know. Was it, it more of a gentleman's agreement back in the day? that you Well, know, it was, you know, yeah. when your home was your castle. Yep. You know, and no one was to come to your home. If anyone ever broke that rule, uh, they would have been in, no, it would have been the end of them, mm. you know. But, um you know, your home was your car, so you, you never entered anyone's home. You know, it's like home invasions. Like the uh, most ridiculous crimes going. Mm. Weak as piss, mm. you know. But, um, you know, and frightening all the little kids. And, I mean, I had a bloke ask me one day, I remember I was in the back of the Hoyts in uh, Pitt Street, you know, the new big Hoyts where the big game place is. There was a little cafe out the area and I had a mate who lived in one of the units there and we were going to talk about a robbery and... Uh, Anyway, I met with this bloke who I wasn't that keen on and I uh, took this other bloke with me and he said, uh, and now there's his house. It's got X amount of dollars in it, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, who's there, just him? He said, no, he's got kids and little kids and I just got up and knocked him straight out. Really? You know, I walked straight out. So, you know, I mean, that was the way I was. That was just my principles, you know. I'm not, I'm not going in, I'm not going to come into your joint and do that. You know what I mean? That's the last place I'll come. Mm. But, uh, you know, if you've got something and, um, you know, or a heap of drugs or whatever it was in those days, you know, or a big bag full of cash, well, we're going to get it, but we're probably going to just break in, come in through the roof and take it, or yeah. even if you've got it in the safe, we'll get it. From you memory, know? it was armoured be- armored vehicles for you. Well, I, uh, I sort of got off on them, Yeah, I must say. I must say that, you know, I mean, you go to the banks, you've got to run up and down, all the tellers. You know, unless unless you hit them late in the afternoon, as we did uh, over the years. I'm not going to say where they were at, of course. Of course. But, um, 
you know, sometimes we'd wait all right on the deaf until they closed, then the big vault would open and then they'd be counting up all the money and we'd know exactly when it was going to happen because of the surveillance we'd done and then we'd just come straight through with sledgehammers and smash in the doors and, and go straight in and rub them that way. But that be that became a bit awkward, so we thought, well, right, we'll try another way. We'll come through the roof. So we used to put cameras up in the roof and uh, watch what time the safe was open, what days the biggest bags were getting counted up. And sometimes we'd even steal the bags that had all the... They used to come round of a night, some people, and they go into the bank, they'd have the key for the mm. bank, and just take the bag out of there. The bank was all the deposit slips and what was going where and how much. So we'd go through all them. Well, you'd know what day the biggest uh, armoured truck pickup was. You know what I mean? So you'd know if there was 700,000 there, 2 million, half a million. You know what I mean? So we used to do things like that. You know, so as I say, with the cameras, we could pick up everything, just put a little camera up in the roof, come through the roof, and uh, sometimes that's exactly what we do. We just come straight through the roof and take it that way. Uh, other times we just... Um, as I say, wait and see that and wait out the front in a van mm. and, uh, you know, and always we never ever pulled up with balaclavas on, you know. We always had the best disguises. And they used to have these shops in Sydney in the old days called the weirdo shops. Yeah. We used to go in there and buy plaits of hair about this long, you know. you buy plaits of hair in different colours and we put on this glue on it and we'd have this special glue uh other stuff to get rid of the glue under there in case because police would start pulling us in, mm. you know, after well, if we weren't, this was later on in life when, when we weren't so sweet and we didn't have a green light off this certain task force and they'd bring us in and they'd start to check the, the <laughs> skin and you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so we had all the tricks in the book, you know. I, I took um, things with me if someone was wounded, you know, and the rules were if you were wounded severely, I mean severely, and you look like dying, well, we are going to finish up. Right. You know, that, they were the rule, you know. That, that's how harsh it was. Wow. You know, so you had to make a pretty big judgment call on that. Yeah. You know? Thank God it never come to that. And uh, and we never, ever used violence against the blokes except pull on the guns on the guards. Mm-hmm. Never had to bash them, never had to, you know, one bloke in the whole time I ever did it unbuckled his because they, they're not even allowed to have them unbuttoned. I learned all these things as years went on in trials and all that sort of thing. But for all those things I've done, I've never been convicted of any of them. I mean, they've charged me, but they fabricated me. They fabricated me that bad that I got up, I ended up just sacking my own counsel in the court and I did it myself. Really? And at the end of the uh, the uh, committal hearing... Uh, uh, the prosecutor actually turned around and he said, mate, you miss your calling in life. You should have been a barrister. <laughs> so, you know, I, I really stuck it up on, you know, everything they did. I went around the uh, the prison, like I'll just give you an example. Uh, uh, blokes, like when they pinched us on these armoured van robberies and uh, they pinched three of us. Now, they thought this was my gang and they weren't. You know, they were just blokes I drunk with. But they pinched them and flogged them and thought they were part of it. Anyway. So while we were down the Raman, I said, now, th- this is the worst place you can talk. So give your mouths a rest down here. And if you, any of you speak out of school down here about anything, right, that you think I've done or whatever, you, right, then you're going to get hurt, mm. right? And I said, this is the one place you've got to shut your mouth down, there, especially here, because everyone's looking for an out. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I used to get down there and then... I started walking around asking blokes. I said, what are you charged with? They said, oh, armed robbery. I said, give us your transcripts. What do you pinch for, armed robbery? Give us your transcripts. So I'd get them all up there and I'd go through them and then I'd have a look and they'd be the same verbal, you know, right. that the police are using. Oh, you got me this time. Oh, I'm glad to get that off my chest, yeah. you know. Oh, fucking oh, that's a relief. Like all of these stupid th- things, you know, and they're all unsigned records of interview. Uh, you know, the police were bodging up. They just write them, and they knew not to ask me anything anyway. Mm. I mean, ever since I've been a kid, they, they never asked me anything because I just, I just rather punch on with them. Mm. I mean, I've been shot out windows at Redfern and the old police station, and uh, and uh, you know, landed on my head down there and just got up and you told them to get armed, <laughs> you know. But um, 
you know, so they knew all the time not to ever ask me anything. Yeah. You know, so they'd work on someone else around me and see if they could weaken them. But, you know, only one bloke ever weakened and he had nothing to do with the gang. He was just a gopher. He was one of them blokes that we'd get to go for this, go for that, go and steal that car, bring it here, you know. You know, he, we might change the colour of that car, the number place and everything. He wouldn't know what it was going to be used for. And we'd hide them for three or four months so they got off the police radar. Mm. And um, and then that's how long they'd only stay on the police scanners in them days in their own car, you know. Once the three months was up, bang, they'd change over and put up the new file. And so you knew you that? Know? Yeah, I knew yeah. that. You know, I knew that through the police that we had on side. Right. You know, that we used to give 10% of every robbery we did. And that's, that was the green light. So whatever we did, that was what organised crime did. Yeah. How does that conversation start with the police about, you know, they, they get a they get a cut of the, the tapes? Well, that had been going on for years. I mean, I knew that as a kid through, well, when I say a kid, probably as I was getting on 18, 19, you know, <clears> after <throat> doing a bit of jail, that the old, the old gang, Lenny McPherson gang, mm. who were into the illegal gambling and protection and, uh, you know, every crime in the book and uh, committed many, many murders. Uh you know, just with other gangsters, didn't take it into the, you know, public arena, as I've said. But um, they, they had the green light. But, and I, but I knew that whoever was the head honcho was going to be scratching the coppers' backs, you know. So if Lenny scratched their backs, he might be the bagman, you know. I mean, they've got up and made all these allegations. He used to go home and make all these tapes and then hand it into the detectives you know, yeah, that's just all rubbish, mate. You know, when these police were seeing blokes on the corner or meeting them in pubs, they had to write down that they were going to see them because they were get, trying to gain information out of them, you know. And most of the time, you know, the same happened to that Whitey Bulger in in America. They did the same thing to him. Uh, but, you know, what they were doing was you know, the information they would give would be against enemies, mm. right? So we knew that deep down, but we never ever saw it take place. You know what I mean? So everyone in Lenny's gang ran under his umbrella because he had the green light to do anything. So that meant the whole gang could have it. Mm. it that meant everything, murder, no matter what. Yep. Right? Sometimes the police would even go and pinch other people, which was the shit side of organised crime, mm. and charge them with the murder, like the bombing of Joe Borg. When they bombed Joe Borg, you know, that was a, a warning to everyone in Sydney then that there's a new gang in town. This is in 1967 over the brothels in Chapel yeah. Lane and Woods Lane and in Darling, I see Sydney. And they just bombed him with the shit house, blew his legs and net off and you know, all over the street in Bondi. And uh, that was a message that just went straight out to everyone that was playing in the, who wanted to step up the ladder in organised crime and try and take rule the roost. Mm. You know, this gang's not going to muck around. This is what you'll get. And so everyone realised the power they had because then two other blokes got charged for it, Paul Misford, Misford and Paul Laddard. Now, I knew them both. They both served about 13, 14 years each for the murders and uh, I was with them at Long Bay. And, uh, you know, I knew quite well they didn't do it. Mm. But, you know, they were used as the scapegoats. And that's what happened in that life, you know. It never happened in the gang that I ran with. No one was ever convicted over anything that we were allegedly involved in. But uh, it certainly happened in that gang. And uh, and then I went to Parramatta Jail in about 1973 and uh, I just knocked out a bloke called John Stuart Regan. I knocked him out in a club. I was a bouncer. And I, 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 I believe that he was, you know, he killed about eight people plus a little kid. Now, he, he had a really big reputation, but I didn't know the stuff he was. And uh, the only reason I've never ever talked about it much is because Chopper Reeb claimed fame for it in one of his bullshit stories that he tells. Right. You know, he just finds stuff and, and just makes up a story around him. Yep. He's very clever at it, but, mm. uh, you know, these things didn't really occur, mate. He's done, all of his life was spent on the, in the boneyard. You know, even though he was in H's division, he was a protected prisoner. Right. You know, and, uh, you know, he worked for the National Crime Authority as a skunk. 
So after that, that incident especially, and I said to myself just before I get in that next part, I said to myself, I'll never be worried about reputations again in my life. I don't care if they've killed 30 blokes or they've bashed up 300. I don't care what their reputations are. I'm getting in first and I'll do my best, you know, no matter what it is. Mm. But um, a few months later I was in prison myself in, um, uh, for assaulting three Commonwealth police. Uh, they bashed up my uh, brother-in-law, so I jumped out and flogged them and then couldn't help myself as usual and uh, got a big rock and uh, caved one of the reds in with the rock. And uh, anyway, I ended up going to prison for it for a few years at uh, Parramatta Jail, and that's where I met Nettie Smith mm-hmm. and a big tower and bloke in those days. And uh, we ended up, uh, I run into him in 1975 or 76 when I got out, and um, and we started running around from that time, from 76 through to late 85. Did he have a reputation at that time? Well, he had a massive reputation, but but he wasn't involved in organised crime. Okay. You know, at that, at that time he was just a shit-arm robber. And, gotcha. You know, he was doing, uh, and he'd been out on bail when I met him. He'd just done 15 years. Well, he got he did six, six and a half years over a rape, mm. uh, him and his mate Bobby Chapman. And they ro- robbed the Fielders Bakery robbery at uh, Harris Park and never got the money. It was pretty dud. You know, and Ned was too big. He stood out like dog's balls. Yeah. You know, like a massive, be like you doing one. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, they'd know exactly who You're it was. You're not going to do that and stick so, out everywhere you go. That's right, yeah. you know. So so when they pulled him in, they, they pulled him in for question when he went to report on, on something and uh, and they, and Roger Rogerson got him as they show on Blue Murder and they, and they, they w- walk, walked him around and walked him all through the uh, thing and said, um, We'll give evidence on your behalf as long as you help us mm. uh, from here on in. And that's what he did. Now, when I run into him, I said, well, how come the other bloke's locked up and you're out on bail? He said, because I paid the cops. You know, and I went, how much you pay him? He said, I had to give him 30 grand. I went, oh. I said, well, that's all right if you can beat the blue. I said, but you, uh, can't you do something and help the other bloke? And he said, well, let's try and get him out on bail. So that night... I run around with him that same first night I met him, running around trying to get bail for this bloke. But there was no way in the world he was ever getting bail. He was on parole. So was Ned. But Ned then became Roger Rogerson's man. Mm. Right Now, after that, he said to me, I said, listen, there's a robbery at so-and-so. I said, I had a bit of a sniff around him because everyone, everyone hated him all of a sudden. You know, he went from this towering bloke and big reputation, everyone liked him and feared him uh, to a bloke that no one liked. And uh, and I thought, well, you know, he's only paid the coppers, so I'm backing him up. He's me mate. You know, that's what I do. I'm a loyal motherfucker. Mm. So um, I started going around backing him up and uh, and anyone who said otherwise, well, you know, I'd give it to him. Uh, that was in the prison system, wherever it was. You know, everyone had an opinion about him and, you know, and as it turned out, really, they were all right. But, um, you know, so I started to realise after I'd done a couple of crimes with him, I said, well, how good's this? Because next minute we're making up a little package and off going 10% of the, the, the police. Now, this is way before he shot, you know, where I took Warren Lee and Frenchie down the lane in 1981 and Roger Rogerson shot him dead. You know, I murdered him in the lane, and that's what he did. He murdered him, and uh, you know, so Ned was the informant bef- long before that. Mm. So, but as I say, I've never witnessed it. Now, if I'd witnessed it, or if I really knew it, then I, I could never have backed him up. Never would have run with a bloke. Mm. You know, and it's the same with all the blokes that work with McPherson, Georgie Freeman, Stan the Man Smith, all those blokes. I never ever saw Lenny doing it. Mm. I knew that he had plenty of power and plenty of pull, so that they run off that umbrella, mm. you know. And uh, so that's what I, you know, I threw an opening for a smart lad. So I ended up getting a, a team, a couple of blokes who'd done life sentences, and you know, they were willing blokes who would kill you. And all of the blokes in our gang would kill you, mm. every single one of them, including myself. So, you know. But 
you know, there were limitations to mine. There wasn't limitations, say, to Ned's, but Ned had this massive reputation that he was this this killer that shot this bloke, shot this bloke, shot this bloke. He never did them, mate. In the whole ten years I ran with him, he never shot anybody. Really? You know, because he's the, he's known as like oh, the guy. Well, he's the one that shot him all, but but he's not. Yeah. He was the one behind the goalpost. Right. You know, he sat behind the goalpost and he'd make up some excuse why the bloke had to go. Mm. You know, or or someone was sticking their head into our business, and I'd just say, "Well, let's go get them. Mm. Why don't you want to get them?" He'd say, "Oh, you might be friends of the McPhersons, or you know, it's going to create a oh, so fucking. Uh, let's get on with it. You know, they're the old school, we're the new school coming through, just like it happens today." Mm. And just said, well, "Right, well, let's go and get him." And uh, so we did, and um, you know, but on the uh, the day it occurred. Uh, he left me posted and I saw that night the weakest, you know, side of him. So what, what happened there, sorry? Well, the bloke, one of the blokes tried to kill him okay. at one stage when I was in prison. So this was a bit of a gang tiff, mm. right? They, he belonged to another crew from around the, the inner suburbs. So I said, well, let's go get him, you know. And he said, uh, oh, you know, no, they're friends of, you know, him and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do it a later way, another way or give him a bad idea. I said, we just try to kill you. Mm. Just let go of the shot. You shot your mate instead. I said, I'm not going to be the next target. So I said, we're going to get him. So we did. So we hunted him around. I did all the homework and found the bloke, located him. Said, let's go. So I went to the place and wherever it was and uh, I just put a Woolworths bag over my head, put two... I was in it, pulled it out of the garbage bin. Right. And let's go. Now, you, you've got to understand, we we had the full protection of New South Wales police here, mate. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, And that's uh, all through Roger Rogerson. Yeah, well, yeah. well, well, he was Ned's main man, so, Just you know, but, but, some but people Ned may had know. other people. Some people know. may not know who Roger Rogerson is. Yeah, he or, was the cop that he was, was the, the He was the main cop in there those days that had the reputation that he'd shoot you, that, Okay. He was in the armed robbery squad. He was in the breakers. He was part of a few different squads. Okay. And uh, quite a willing policeman, yep. you know, a water-winning officer that, you know, killed three men in the line of duty, so he says. And uh, as we know, one of them was definitely a murder. Mm. Uh, but, you know, so he was his main man. So we run under that umbrella. Now, that was pretty hard for me coming from the streets, mm. running around in street gangs. And uh, doing crimes with blokes without that sort of help, yeah. you know, like 95, 99% of the prison population don't have it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because there's only ever been three major organised crime gangs in Sydney in the historic days of, you know, having the green light. Mm. Right? You know, there's a few blokes around today that probably get it, but they'd be major police informants, mm. you know, and uh, working for the Crime Commission or something. So... We'd all do it. So knowing that, so I just, well, let's go. We've got nothing to worry about. You know, you're not going to get half inch over it. So pinch. So down we go to the place. Bang, get up to the place and uh, I went straight in the door, looked back and he bolted on me. Took off up the street. So I just finished the job off and, and left. And uh, by that I mean I shot the black. Uh, I pissed off and... Um, Got up to the car and when we got in the car, I just smashed the light in the car. He had a light on in there and I give him the worst spray going, you know. I said, you left me, pal. Oh, no, other people were coming so I run up there to, you know, mm. just a verbal story that he come up with. But I saw another side of the bloke and, and I thought, you're trying to utilise other people there to do your dirty work. Well, it's not going to be me again, mate. All right? So if we get doing it, we're going in and we're going in as a crew. You know what I mean? So that's why I ended up putting the other team together. And I said, all right, well, if you've got all this help, then, you know, what what the other gang's got, the McPherson gang and all that, is is virtually old hat. You know what I mean? The illegal gambling days are gone. The TABs have been set up. The book of the SP bookies in the pub are going. You know what I mean? So mm. I said, 
you know, it's time that we just step up the ladder here and, uh, you know, we'll do all the major robberies. I said, get the armed robbery side. Can you get them, sweet? He said, yeah. So he got them through Rogerson and uh, Rogerson would go in front of them. One of them would come and see us and we go, right, this is where we're going to be on Tuesday. We're going to rob that. Bang, bang, bang. And you go there after it. Was there ever a fear that, you know, if you said, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do this job, that they would turn up and turn on you? No, I never ever had that fear with it because everything just works so smoothly. Okay. You know, and, and, and that's how organised crime was. It was just, you know, it was just so, you know, spot on, you know. So, I mean, even if we got involved in a bad stink in the public somewhere, you know, with some imbeciles that wanted to try and take us on one full piece or something, you know, or they pulled a knife out or a hatchet or, you know, which has happened a few times. So... You know, we'd leave them all over the place. Well, we'd have to go down and pay the local coppers plus the coppers that looked after us. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'd, I didn't ever like drinking with them, you know what yeah. I mean? Because, as I said, I come from the streets and I, and I, and I wasn't keen on it, yeah. you know. So when Ed would he'd be with them all the time, he'd want to talk to them all the time. Right. You know, it really sort of pissed me off a bit. Yeah. But, you know, that's how he kept, he kept it up and so uh, – we were all happy to run under that umbrella, you know. And as I say, if we would have known that he was dropping blokes in, you know, like a hundred percent, well, the the team would have ended him, and I would have ended up the Trump. But I couldn't have played it because I didn't want to be the. I I, I was happy to be the organizer, which I was, and and not only did I help put the team together, you know, yeah, uh, more than anyone. And uh, I planned everything, everything I looked at. Now, all the connections for the guns I had, I'd, I was already I used to run around selling them for the police for a certain copper that uh, ended up in Balmain for years as the boss. I used to sell his guns on the street when I was freaking 18, 19, you know. He'd give them to me for 300 bucks. I'd go and get five or 600 for them, you know. And uh, I was doing them all the time. So I was sort of, and he never asked me nothing, never asked me to, mm. you know, question or, you know, what so-and-so doing. I'd tell them to get armed, mm. you know, and they all knew that. So they were happy to leave me alone. I know that Ned got sort of quizzed when I first started joining up with him. They said, you know, this bloke knocks out coppers left, right and centre, mm. you know, as I'd been doing all my teenage life and stuff, you know. So... They said, you know, he's got to understand that there's a, uh, the rules are in place here that you're not to touch the police, not to harm them, not to shoot them, not to stab them, not, you know. Well, that worked fine for many years until one day I did. So what happened that day? What led up to, because you, you stabbed the police prosecutor? Yeah, from police memory? prosecutor, yeah. Well, he what was, happened? Well, he was part of the whole organised crime system. He just died uh, yesterday, actually. Really? Okay. And uh, Malcolm Spence was his name. We used to call him Big Brother. Because Big Brother's watching over you, you know what I mean. So uh, he, he was one of the main head blokes in the court that all the corrupt police had used, and uh, if they wanted someone to get bail or not get bail, have their record dismissed, you know, and yep. cleaned up uh, before they got up before the magistrate, and that's what he did. That's what he got paid for. So he'd do it on behalf of the police. So he had all the crooked cops on side. So we knew that. So we'd drink with them. He grew up with all the blokes in Piermont that came from another gang we called the Friendly Gang. Now, they were all they were organised crime, but they were <laughs> professional thieves and drug importers. Well, they didn't become drug importers till later on in life, but before that they were major uh, thieves and they were extremely good. I mean, they stole a Dior diamond worth, you know, it was about 2,000 carats in front of security guards. I mean, they were brilliant, absolutely brilliant, these blokes. But... Um, what was I just talking about prior to that? Um, we were talking about um, you got you lost me on the two thousand carats. I was trying yeah, to work out in my head yeah. how that's worth. I was just talking about uh, that gang. Oh, that Malcolm Spence. So he grew up with all that bloke. He played for the Piermont Colts and all that. So he knew all the knockabouts. Yep. So he started doing business for a few of them when they get into trouble and and uh, so that Mickle Hurley, who was the leader of that gang. Uh, you know, he he started getting all these connections and he had a lot of connections. Very smart man, very clever thief. Worked with some of the old kangaroo gang from the old days 
um, uh, you know, knew how to get into safes, how to dig tunnels under the ground, the hole in the wall. I mean, they were brilliant, you know, brilliant thieves without using the guns and the force we did, you know. So we we were the controllers and we can we looked after them if they needed their back scratched or, you know, needed some help or protection or unloading something. Yeah. We'd watch them and look after them, but we had nothing to do with anybody else. So, which was only the McPherson gang. But that Malcolm Spence, he started doing all that and then naturally when we started to drink together, he'd he'd get in the company. So, you know, I used him, people used him in our team and uh, as I say, he was our main connection to this. So if you got pinched and you, you come to me and you said, listen, mate, I'm pinched on this blue, I, I've got another arm robbery I've been pinched on before. This one's only, you know, like it's a bit lighter of a go, but, you know, it's still worth a few eight years or something in the nick. Uh, we go and see him and just say, mate, can you break it down to the smallest thing you can here? And he'd say, yeah, good as gold. So say, well, that's going to cost you 40000 mate. Right? So we'd make sure that happened and he'd nod his head and plead guilty in the low court and he'd get two years. Right, and nod his head to three or four other crimes mm. that he never did right. to clean up the books so they look good, the cops, yep. right? And then that's how they work. That's how it all operated. And then they'd, and we'd go and go, here's 20000 for you to Malcolm Spence and mm. the other twenty would go into our kick. Right. You know what I mean? So that's how it operated. So as as the years were going on, we're, we're in a, uh, you know, he, he was always a bit of a two-faced bastard, you know, and he loved more like the Mickle gang and all that, but he was told to keep away from us, really, uh, by, you know, people that had had him under surveillance in our company, by federal police, by everyone. I mean, he, he's a major police prosecutor in Sydney. Mm. So he'd been told to keep out of our company, really, but, you know, we're, we were always in the company. So he didn't give a hump about it and no one else did, so... Uh, he was, and everything he did that was a bit chunky, they'd hide under the carpet, you know, and things like that didn't come out until my trial, where you know he wouldn't accept money off me to, um, you know, dismiss the charges that he'd filed against me. So, what had happened? Someone had been to Internal Affairs and told Internal Affairs that Malcolm Spence was driving around a Mercedes-Benz that came off the wharf that was supplied by Mickle Hurley's gang and that was his present to them for looking after him in the court, right? So he went on a fishing expedition, Malcolm Spence, and started asking blokes. So what he did, I walked into the Captain Cook Hotel where all the friendly gang drunk and sometimes we drank in, uh, in uh, Miller's Point in Sydney, just under the Harbour Bridge there, and uh, walked down there and uh, I walked in. Anyway, he said, are you going over to Piermont today? I said, yeah, I am. I'm going to Balmain, actually. And he said, well, can you give me a lift? I said, yeah, good as gold. So we had a few drinks there and I was drinking with other blokes and then I said, come on, I'm going, hop in the car. So I drove him over and now I never talked in my car, didn't do anything like that, so there wasn't a word spoken, you know, bar, you know, nice weather. Mm. Got over to the hotel, walk into the pub, there's no one there except the barman. I get in there and he said, you've been to internal affairs about me and said that um, I've, I'm driving a stolen car. I said, what are you fucking talking about? I said, don't put me on the fucking dog, mate. And he said, I'm telling you. He said, I said, who told you that? He said, Ned. And I went, well, you know, so this is after I'd left Ned's company. Okay, this is yeah. about 85 or something, right? So... No, it would have been later. It would have been about 86, 87, early 87. So, because I got pinched 87 for it. So, he pulls his teeth out, right? And I went, (laughs) bad mistake, mate. I said, put them back in your head. I said, you're half pissed. Put them back in your head. I'm going to leave you here tonight on your own. You think about what you've said and I'll see you tomorrow. So the following day, I drove down the Captain Cook Hotel and he was with two detectives I knew who I used to pay. So he was with them. So they come over to me and they said, mate, you know, don't do, do nothing to him. I said, oh, he needs to pull his head in and, 
you know, don't, don't go accuse me of things like that because I'll just cut his head off. I, not a koala bear as far as I'm concerned, mate, a protected species. So, so uh, I walked up to him and I said, well, what do you got to say today? He said, well, I'm still trying to inquire about I said, well, but you've made the accusation. Like you've already accused me. And he said, well, until I know, you know, I'll, that's where I'm la- keeping my head. And I said, well, you better find out. I'm going to give you a few days. Anyway, I fucking brooded on him and I brooded on him. And Anyway, it was right near Christmas. So these few coppers that I had on side that you could just pay, they never asked you a thing. I'd just go, listen, because I was running my own team. After I left Nettie Smith in 85, I put my own crew of robbers together and, you know, drug dealers and whatever they were, right? I ended up just going down and fronting them. So what I was just trying to explain is I was with this other crew at this time. So what happened, <clears throat> I went to uh, the Epping Hotel at, at uh, Christmas and upturned these detectives with a few of the blokes that I knew that I got around with. So we're having lunch and uh, and I give them a big bag under the table, you know, as a Christmas present. Mm-hmm. Right? That's all what I did. So as soon as I left there, I went into the public bar. Everyone left. They pissed off their way and I went mine. I walked into the Epping Hotel, into the public bar where I'd drunk ever since I was a teenager. And as I was in there, uh, this bloke came up in front of me. He said, oh, you belted me son not long ago. Whack. You know, he's a bloke I knew and I respected him. He was a nice bloke. And I said, mate, your son was acting like a clown, so, you know, I pulled him into gear. I only hit him once. You know, I didn't king hit him or, you know, I said so. And he was standing with him. I said, so, mm. tell him the truth. So anyway, this other bloke walked out who was, he'd killed a nun or something in a car accident or something and got three years jail or something. And, uh, you know, always fancied himself this bloke has been a strong bloke. He couldn't fight, but he was one of them real strong blokes. Anyway, he he stuck his head into it. I just said, oh, piss off, mate. And I walked down the lane. Well, he's still up, he's up yelling out at me from the top of the lane. I just got down to my car and I said, I've had enough of this fucking idiot. So I opened up my car and I just pulled out my fucking big blade I had and I stuck it down the back of my pants and I said, come down here, big mouth. I said, well, go down to Baronia Park here. This is where I used to sleep when I was a kid. I said, come down the park, just you and me. He said, I don't go that far for a picnic, mate. I said, well, you haven't got the balls to come down here now. Give your mouth a rest, right? Mm. So he didn't come, so I up in the car and drove off, but I was hyped. Now, I was, I was going to go home. I was going to go, well, not home, but I was going to go and stay at this place where I always did when I come down to Sydney because I lived up the coast. Okay. So I'd come down three days a week, do what we had to do, and I'd go home and spend time with my family. Now, I ended up uh, driving and then I went, no, nah, I'm going over to Five Dock. So I went over to Five Dock, had a drink with a few blokes there, and we drove down to Surrey Hills, had a few more drinks there, and then... I said, right, Al, let's go. So as we're driving along, these are two blokes that are just knockabout blokes. One was called uh, Buffalo Bill, they called him, real big bloke, massive big hands on him. And uh, the police always thought I was doing robberies with him. And um, and this other bloke who was a mate of his, Dan Carnegie, who, as I said, was a, a just a gopher, mm. you know, had nothing to do with us. But, um, you know, just a shipment that we called on the side. But... Um, Anyway, so he said to me, he said, let's drive down to, uh, we'll, we'll just go back to Five Dock. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, I'm going down to see Spence. So I drove down Bullwara Road, Olimo. It's a real narrow street, so you can only drive real slow. So his story later on was that I cruised past, you know, to spot him on behalf of Ned Smith and I was going to knock him, mm. you know, kill him on be- well, I wasn't even getting around with Ned Smith, but that was a story. It made headlines, you know what I mean? So anyway, so I pulled up, pulled up the car, and I walked straight in. And he was talking to a heap of blokes, and I said, get outside. I said, well, I'll never talk to you. And uh, he said, uh, oh, I'm not talking shop tonight, mate. I said, get outside. Follow me outside now. I'm going to flog you. Right? So he said, well, you won't be doing that. So how do you come? He follows me. He follows me up the whole length of the whole hotel. 
right into the back lane. There's not even a street light there. They put one in straight after it so they could say there was a light there, right? You know, so we could see this knife that was coming at him. So anyway, he got in the laneway and I left hooked him and dropped him. And I said, now get up. Get up, you big mouth. Oh, mate, I'm so sorry. I was out of school. I've said the wrong thing. He started, I just, and I just hated seeing the the weakness in him come out. You know what I mean? So all of a sudden that, that other side of me come out and out come out the knife and I jammed him in the guts and then I jammed it straight into his throat. And uh, he had a big polo neck jumper on. Mm. Well, he just thought I'd punched him. So if you never see a knife coming at you, that's all you think you are. You can be in a fight and be punching on and have holes that coming out of yeah. you everywhere and all of a sudden you start to lose power. Yeah. That's what happened to him. He started to get a bit wobbly. By this time... Someone had called the police and said well, I was bashing him in the lane. So they all turned up and then they just threw him in the car and ambulance and they took off and the police took me down to Darlinghurst Police Station, kept me there for a while. I just said, oh, he'd be sweet. I'd, I'd even forgotten what I'd done. Mm. I was that pissed. Mm. You know, and I'd been drinking wine that day. And it was like giving whiskey to the Indians, you know what I mean? Especially with a, you know, a, a brooding temper that I had. So next minute... Um, uh, one of the cops that I knew come past and I said, what's happened? And he said, uh, no, we're going to charge her with malicious wound, Abbo. He said, we might be able to break it down later on, but that's all I can do. And I said, all right. So I pulled out 2000 and I said, get me bail tonight, give him cash. He got me bail. And I walked out, well, the other coppers were filthy, all the coppers. So next minute they called me on the phone. They said, come and end, end yourself in or we're going to come and kick your door in. I said, well, I'm down there. I said, I'll land myself in on Monday morning. That's when I'll be. Mm. So I'm walking around for thinking, trying to get my head together the next day, you know, you imbecile, what have you done here, you know? But there goes my green light. Yeah. Is, so you're pretty, you know fil- I mean? you're pretty filthy yourself. Oh, yeah, I'm filthy on myself, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I should have just flogged him, yeah. you know what I mean? But I just got pissed off with him and I brooded about it because no one's ever going to walk around and say that about me, otherwise I'm going to chop into them. I don't care how old I am. Mm. Who they are, you know what I mean. So, uh, and and my reputation was everything to me. You know that was, you know, I could go to any gang and I was respected. Mm. You know because they knew I was staunch, and so that occurred. And then um, I come the Monday, I handed myself in. And they charged me with attempted murder, and uh, I ended up getting bail uh, for fifty thousand dollars. And uh, then they just started. Now, it was funny because the armed robbery squad was the ones that arrested me. Now, this should have been a homicide matter, mm. you know. I handed over to those because it was an attempted murder. Mm. But naturally, the armed robbery squad, who were all his mates and all the corrupt blokes, right. all, ga- all gathered together to back him up. So they had a couple of little sneaky little goes at me. I knew that they were going to try and knock me. Yep. And uh, they hired other people to do it, of course. But um, anyway, I got through the break. You know, I jerried to them and uh, a couple of them happened up here in Warners Bay. Really? And uh, But, you know, I got on to them, you know. So yeah. once you foil them, they, they shit themselves. So you know how were they I mean? trying to knock you? Oh, well, they were just sitting off me, waiting to trap me. Mm. You know, as I'd come out in the car, they were going to jam me. And, but that, they were hiring crims, mm. you know what I mean? So I ended up finding out who one of them was and, and I took him for a drive. And, uh, and and I'll cut it short. I put a couple of holes in him, mm. and someone saved him. Uh, someone turned up. I won't say who it was because it'll give it away. Mm. But years later, uh, he actually wrote to the paper when I released my book and give me a rap. And he said the bloke was it had all the right in the world to finish me off, right? Yeah. And he didn't. And he said only because he was sprung. He said, otherwise I was gone. He said, this bloke had given me a couple of chances in my life before and he said, then I did something for uh, for the police and uh, and he said, um, so I respect the bloke. I've got to give him all the respect in the world. Like he's just, you know, he's a, he's a staunch bloke. I mean, he really gave me a good rap, this bloke. And I said, I let him go after that. I wasn't going to chase him anywhere after no, that fair rap. Enough. But... Um, you know, I mean, that's just the way it was. I worked on those sort of things, you know. If people shit on me, you know, then I either 
belted them and give them a warning or I threw them in the boot and scared the shit out of them, put them in the sleep roll, knocked them out, you know, mm. uh, throw them in the boot. Then I'd start talking out the back like I did to one bloke one day with my head and uh, we put him in the sleep roll. Next minute, well, well, they don't know where they are when they've been in it, you know. Sometimes I've had blokes talk, well, they kept talking in different language. You know what I mean? <laughs> really? Yeah, because it just uh, really fucks. I don't know what it does to their head. But anyway, I, I, I put it put this bloke out and we, we put him in the boot of the car. Then when we're talking, we're going, how's the ground over there? And he said, oh, it's a bit hard over here. I said, well, it's pretty soft here. Then you get it from the boot, you know. <laughs> mate, mate, oh, come on, mate. The bloke was crying his eyes out. Right, tough bloke, right? Yeah, I don't blame him. And uh, he said, mate, come on, mate. Fucking. And we just pulled him out and said, mate, we're just talking shit to you, you poor imbecile, right? I said, you haven't moved, look where you are. <laughs> right, you know, it was funny when I look back, you know, but they were the stupid things we do, you know. But, uh, you know, it was an intimidation thing, of course. But, uh, you know, the next time mightn't have been so easy. Mm. So, you know, don't, don't keep doing it because you'll only push the button, you know. But, but my difference and Ned's difference were two different things. Like Ned would, Ned would get jealous of something or he'd hear that and that copper would come up to him and say, oh, so-and-so, this Billy. Uh, I'll say his name, Billy Boylan. His name was uh, mentioned on the phone the other day and he was bagging you. He was bagging you to another crim. So Billy Boylan had served a life sentence and uh, was a mate of mine in those days, good bloke. And uh, so I called him up, you know, because I knew Ned wanted to get him not, but he wasn't going to knock him, Ned, mm. two of the other blokes in the gang were. So I called him up and I said, listen, uh, Bill, when you're uh, coming in today, you're coming in to see us, right? He said, yeah, that's right. I said, well, bring your wife and your kids with you. Don't ask me why. You understand why. Right. I'm sure you get the drift. He said, yep. So he came in. Called his family. I walked in. I said to Ned, I said, I said, his whole family's here, mate. Nothing can happen to him. So he got through the break. You know what I mean? I did that to that many people, I couldn't tell you. But all he was doing was, you know, just spreading his dislike about him. Mm. I mean, you know, he didn't like him, mm. you know, and that was fair enough. And everyone in the gang, I, they used to come back and say to me, they'll only do business with you. Like this gang over here will only do business with you because they don't want him involved mm. because no one trusted him, you know, and that all stemmed from that Liam Frenchy thing and it stayed with him all his life. I mean, even though he's a big tower and man and he could hold his hands up and all that sort of stuff, he, um, he, he, he had this false side of him that, you know, he built up himself and the, then the police built it up and then the media... Mm. Naturally, made him and in, in, turned him into a you know a massive giant, mm. and uh, and that he was this mass murderer, but he was the bloke behind the scenes. You know, he killed a woman, two women, uh, put them both in a sleeper hole. Someone else killed them, right? Mm. On both occasions, one was a police informant, uh, gave evidence against police, taped them. The other one was Sally Ann Huckstep. And uh, he was there, and I knew he was going to do it because he asked me to come with him. And I wasn't even getting around with him. I said, I don't got nothing to do with having it, killing a woman, mate. Yeah. That's not my go. I said, hey, well, stick it up your ass. So I knew it was even going to occur, mm. you know, but, you know, I thought, oh, he might have been talking through his ass too. But then, then a couple of weeks later, bang, she, she found floating in the pond. Well, you know, he used to go home. He'd, like he'd tell people everything, you know, and he'd always be bragging to his girlfriends or, you know, their family. He was always talking out of school about these things he did that he never did. And one of his favourite sayings used to be, I get really lucky when I kill someone. I used to think, I said to him one day in the car, the fuck are you killed? You know what I mean? Like, you know, you haven't been shot near the gangsters. Mm. You know what I mean? And then the last bloke that he got, he did the same thing. As I said, put him in the sleeper hole. And then he was choked to death, the bloke. Mm. You know, him and another bloke. They choked him to death and he was found out in the, 
the dunes at uh, Botany, which was like the burial ground for a lot of the gang land uh, stuff that happened in those days. And because um, it was easy to dig, of course. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so he was found out there. His name was Mark Johnson. He was a male model. And uh, they found his car somewhere out near, near the airport somewhere with a kilo of uh, cocaine in it. So they didn't even check that to see if he had any money or, yeah. uh, you know, and he was killed for a few lousy thousand, really. Um, you know, to cover the arse of a little solicitor. Mm. But uh, you know, that was the type of stuff that Ned got involved in, things like that, and he'd say to me, oh, we're going to get this bloke or that bloke, and I'd say, for what reason? And he'd tell this reason. So I'd go and check it out myself. I'd go to the, one of the jacks of the one, you know, and say, go and find out about that. And he'd go, that, that's not right, mate. So I'd just drop off it. Mm. You know what I mean? I mean, the only the only ones I'd attack would be blokes who robbed us or, or blokes who... Um, Try to muscle in on something that we had, you know, or we're doing. When you said before you were res- like respected by all the other gangs, yeah. do you think that was based off fear or fairness? No, fairness, I think. Yeah. I think that, you know, uh, they, they all looked at me as a bloke who'd shut his mouth and, uh, you know, I've always had a lot of common sense, uh, you know, when I'm sober. Mm. Uh, I don't think there's too many drunk blokes who've got too much common sense. No chance. But, uh, you know. And of course, the papers all picked that up. Oh, he's a bad drunk, and you know all that sort of shit. But uh, you know, I'm not. I'm actually a good drunk, and uh, you know, until someone pisses me off, mm. you know, like I am when I'm sober. I don't need to be pissed about do anything. Yeah. But um, uh, you know, but I, I could always go to another team and just go. Listen, why don't we just break this fight down here? I mean, we used to have meetings in police stations. You know, with this fraction and that fraction, yeah. you know, from another gang and when the gang wars were on, you know, and uh, and so did Tom Domican and blokes like that. The, like they were in this other gang called Barry McCann's gang. You know, they didn't really weren't. He ran the legal gaming thing, and they just knew that the old gang of Lenny was getting old, and Barry McCann still run the legal gaming place in in the cross, and he used to have one in Wollongong years ago and he'd been involved in the murder years ago of uh, Charles Chicka Reeves. So he's a pretty willing bloke. He had a bit of go in him, but he was an organised crime. He, he run and paid organised crime like Lenny's gang to operate his things, you know, to his illegal – you had to pay Len, mm. you know, if you opened up a place like that. So he ended up joining with – Tom Domican and Roy Thurger and blokes like that, they got this group around them that were, you know, they were mainly blokes that could fist fight. They weren't really killers. And uh, and he got these crews around him and uh, they started importing drugs. Well, Barry McCann did. And then they started getting uh, thoughts of grandeur here and they said, well, let, let's take over what Len's got. Well, I can kill all them and... So there was little sneak goes going at Lenny and and little things like that. And so next minute we got involved because of Christopher Dale Flannery, who came from Melbourne. And they called him Rendercule. And uh, he was a hired gun that worked for uh, George Freeman. And then he started knocking around with us. And, uh, you know, that's a bit of a long story how he sort of got involved with us. But, he, 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 you know, there was an allegation he wanted to kill us. And uh, so, so we just confronted him over it. Uh, of course, it was all bullshit. And um, but um, it wouldn't surprise me that that's what he said. But um, anyway, he ended up getting in the company, and I said to Ned, Don't, "If you start knocking around with him, then I'm I'm out of here because he's a toe cutter, a backstabber, and uh, and all he used is a hired gun. He's pretty pissed weak at everything else he does. Everything he's done, he's been caught for. So." Uh, I don't want nothing to do with the bloke. You know, hide guns to me are not worth four bob. You know what I mean? Mm. If that's all you can do in your life, then you need to pick another fucking game, mate, you know. I mean, he was a pretty likeable type of a bloke, but when he got with his wife, she had she had more thoughts of grandeur than he did, you know what I mean? She wanted him to be number one at all costs. And uh, she, she was a police dog anyway, a police informer. 
and uh, and proved that years later when she gave evidence against Tom Domican and said that uh, Tom Domican drove past the house and shot him. Well, she'd just got on the phone prior to that and rang up Ned and said, I just saw Rabbo, he just drove past in his Jag with a machine gun and just tried to murder us all. <laughs> Ned rang me up and told me this. I said, what, in my own car? Yeah. I said, well, is she fucking serious, is she? So anyway, I had to go and confront him over it and fucking pull him into gear. And uh, as it turned out, it was another crew and Domican got locked up for it because what they didn't understand was they might have run a legal gambling place up up there, Barry McCann, but Tom Domican was new to this scene. Mm. You know what I mean? He wasn't a gangster. He, he wanted to be, you know. Um, he was a reasonable bloke, you know, and, uh, you know, and probably as solid as a rock, wouldn't tell on you, but... He was, he was running around bridging up himself that he was this real big tough guy and karate expert and he was very good with his feet but he couldn't hold his hands up and uh, he ended up getting him and trying to be the strong arm for this crew and all of a sudden they started rising up and this is where it all started. So they went around where McPherson and that kept all their legal game and stuff that was going into a club or being shut down or so they just started throwing them out on the street in Enmore and uh, smashing them up. So that's created havoc and started a bit of a tit-for-tat war and, and we got involved because of Flannery. And then so we went to a few meetings with Lenny McPherson and in the end it was really Lenny and us against them. You know, and at the end of the day they didn't understand how the organised crime network worked and they ended up in prison. You know what I mean? He served five years, Tom, before he realised it. And yet I even went to his solicitor, Jeremy Cullen, and now I didn't know Tom from Barisap, and I said, ask for the tapes on my phone that'll prove that she rung up and blamed me first, right? And then you'll walk. They didn't even do it. So that's what I did, you know what I mean? That was That was my... Just that, those principles within mm. me, I didn't want someone to go and serve, you know, years over something that he was accused of doing, whether he did or whether he didn't. Mm. You know, drove past Flannery South and nicked his ear with a bullet. Well, you know, whoever they were, they were amateurs because they'd never done it before, mm. you know. Uh, the one thing you don't do is miss. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you're going after someone, you make sure you're close enough to make sure it's all over, you know. And uh, I've had, had plenty of experience at amateurs trying to knock me, you know, and a, and some pro ones too, mm. of course. But um, and I've had twenty attempts on me life. Twenty. Twenty, and uh, you know that doesn't mean that every time they were trying to knock me. Yeah. You know they were trying to shoot me that day, but they, they were setting up the plans, and, and they were, I knew where they were going to get me, mm. and so I changed direction. The next day I'd be somewhere and where they were sitting, I'd be there taking pictures of them, you know, and they they jerry to me, you know what I mean? So I was on to them all the time. I knew where they were, where they worked, where their houses were, mm. what they did, you know, because I got all this information through number plates through someone in the NRMA I had suite, yeah. all right? So that's how I used to get all the number plates and track them down. So I knew exactly who they were and if they were going to put one in me, then... I was, you know, and I wasn't going to go down. Then, mm. you know, it was going to be the biggest retaliation ever. When no? you when you talk about these things, and you know, they're obviously yeah. from twenty, thirty years ago or yeah. more. Yeah. Do you ever meet up with some of these people or cross their paths and sort of like trade uh, old war stories? Has that ever happened? No, it's no, like a, it's they, a lifetime. Yeah, yeah, it's a lifetime thing. You know, I guess if they, you know, I'm sure I've been in the same place where a couple of scum. Skunks have been that I didn't like, you know. Mm. I won't call them skunks. You know, they were doing what they thought was right, yeah. you know, at the time, you know. And, and most of the time they were hired. See, all the attempts that came from my life all come from the Ned Smith crew. Right. Right, so Ned put four writs on me, right. He used Christopher Dale Flannery and Laurie Prendergast. And then Michael Drury was shot, the copper. By Laurie Prendergast, not Christopher Dale Flannery, as they keep telling the world. They just want this bullshit out there all the time. Laurie Prendergast and him worked together. Laurie killed him. 
Chris was somewhere else to protect his ass, mm. right? Now, then they tried to make me the scapegoat because uh, Drury didn't die. They made me the scapegoat. So I wasn't in their company at this stage, right? So they said, I know that there was a meeting at Flannery's house and someone there warned me about it and they come and told me. And they said, you're going to be used for all the gangland slayings, right? Well, not only that, but the Michael Drury shooting. So this gun that was used had already shot three people, right, in the gangland wars, right, and it had shot Michael Drury. So Ned set up a plan that we were going to go up and just hand over this gun. Now, this is how the blue light, Ned come to me because we had, we'd been enemies. I'd already tried to knock him. I'd already tried to kill him myself. And then he came to me one day and he said, you're right, Abbo. You've been right all the time. All these blokes like putting Flannery in the gang, stupidest thing I ever did. So, well, I told you that from word go, mate. That's why I left you, right? And then you have put on all these hits on me. No, I didn't. I said, yeah, you did. Look, I'm over it. I just couldn't get me. I'm here. If you mm. want me, you come and get me. But you'll never do it. You won't do it, Ned. I know how you operate. So he started to put in this plan. He said, well, what about this? So he put in this plan together to, so I'd go and get Flannery and all them because they were trying to knock me over the jury shooting and involving police in it, right? Crooked police, right? Now, I won't say his name because he's got a family, but he went to the house on behalf of Rogerson. Rogerson sent him there. They went to the house in Tempe at his house, Christopher Dale Flannery's, and they talked. Now, someone was there that day who overheard it, and then they come out and told me and warned me, right? So I thought, oh, okay. But anyway, Ned come out of that and then he told this person and the person then told me, but then he, they said, well, I'm going to tell him. So then he threw it around and he tried to make out like he was on my side, right, to throw it all off, right? So that night we sort of went somewhere together and, and then he said, this plan come together and he said, we'll sort them out, just you and I, and then you and I will get back together. I said, no, there'll be no you and I getting back together. That's fucking finished. That I'll leave you alone after that. You leave me alone, Mike. You go on with your thing. I'll do mine. I knew he had no power anymore. Roger Rogerson had been kicked out of the force. I had my own, I had my own source of income, mm. you know what I mean? And, uh, and we were earning more than I'd ever earned with him. You know, and, and, mate, I'm talking $100 million here over 10 years. Wow. Right? You know, and that's a lot of money when you look back over the years, $100 yeah. Million. yeah. Then you're paying your gang, you're paying barristers, you're paying other people. Money's going into the ground, money's going into other jobs, and sometimes you lose it. Mm. Sometimes these blokes get all of it. Yeah. Feds or, yep. you know what I mean? So you lose millions. So you just got to cop it sweet and get back in the saddle and get back to work. So uh, anyway, so Ned puts this plan together and away we go. And then when we get down there, he's going to come with me up to the cross. We're going up to catch up with one of the blokes who's hiding out with Flannery at the time, right? Because over this thing uh, and plus having a go at George Freeman trying to shoot him. And they naturally knew that it was Flannery. So he put himself into seclusion and I knew that. I knew that for 100%. And then the other bloke said, now this is one of the blokes from the gang, he said, well, go up and get him. And I knew he was one of the ones that tried to knock me on behalf of Ned, right? But I said to myself, when we get to this meeting, when it finally does happen, we get there and Ned's going to come in with me and help me pot these blokes, I'm going to pot him as well, Yeah. right? So... I'm not going there one out. I'm going there with a crew behind me somewhere, right, to back it up to make sure nothing goes wrong. So they trapped me. I get into this pub. It was a good trap. It was a good plan. They finally get me. It's too long to go into. But they, I get into the pub with Ned. We're going to leave. We're going to take up this gun, this same gun that shot Drury mm. and three other blokes in the underworld, right? Mick Sayers. And a couple other blokes. Les Cole, another bloke. I forget the other bloke's name. So they take that 
got it in a paper bag. And he said, well, and we'll give them some money, you know, so they can hide out for a while. So he comes out, puts a paper bag in the car. He said, oh, wait on. He walked inside and he said, I've just got to make a call. He said, listen, I'll have to stay here. He said, Roger's coming over to see me. He said, it's pretty urgent. I said, well, where's the money? Give us the money you're going to give me. He said, oh, fuck them, don't give them the money, just give them the gun. So I drive off with this gun. So I've already got my own gun on me. Mm. I, I always had a gun, the police knew I carried it, and, um, and they allowed it. Mm. Right? So I drive off, and next minute a big panel van starts chasing me, you know, fall on me. And that's one of them old Sandman ones, you know, with the curtains in yeah. it. And, uh, and uh, I thought, jeez, I've, I've seen that car before. You know what I mean? Because as I say, we used to steal them and keep them off the grid for a yeah. long time, right? And change the number plate. So anyway, as I was driving along, I could see this a bit of movement in the back of this car and someone peeping through the little curtains that they had, you know, like a typical Sandman wagon. It was Surfy's truck. So I ended up coming down past the big cathedral in Sydney and, uh, and heading down towards uh, King's Cross into William Street and where the museum is, turn left at the lights there where the New Zealand Hotel is. And then it was pretty packed. It was Saturday, lunchtime, and up the street is, you know, going all the way up the Coca-Cola sign, all the lights are. So they've had to come close to me. So I put down the window, the electric window of the Jag I had, which had a 350 Chev motor, and I looked over and I, I said, what are you looking at, your dog? I said to the driver, so if he was a crim, he was going to burr up, but he just went, you know, give me the bird, and I thought, oh, it could be the cops. So I'll just keep, you know. So I drove off, got up to the pub where I'm supposed to meet this bloke, go into the pub, naturally there's no one there. I walked up and had a big bay window, the King Arthur's Court it was, just at the top of the cross. And I got there and I walked straight over the window and I watched that car go up the top of the hill turn right at the Coca-Cola sign, then right again as it comes down the ramp to get back on the, you know, Bayswater Road, whatever it is that heads down towards the museum again, right, and Town Hall Station. Uh, but there's parking spots on the side. So I see them pull into there. I said, oh, they're dead set on to me. So uh, they're right, well, they might be federal police. So next one up pulls a cop car beside them, detective's car. Out gun says detective that I'm, right, and starts giving them the finger, giving them a rev. Yeah. So I thought, well, I always like to go on the lines then. You know what I mean? No, it's no good me turning left or when I should have gone right and just face it, mm. right? So if I go left, I don't know what's going to happen. So I thought, no, oh, fuck it. I'll just go straight up. So I pulled out both guns, put them between me legs, and I drove up the street. As I got up the street and coming down the ramp, Police car took off in front of me, the other one came out behind me. I drove down William Street, turned right at the New Zealand Hotel, went up past the cathedral, round Hyde Park, into St James Station, where St James Station is, and uh, David Jones is on the corner. Mm. That's Market Street, I think. And I head straight down towards Piermont. I, I turned right into there, come to the first set of lights, they've got to come around the corner behind me. They sat back. When I looked through the lights, I could see this cop car sitting there. Now, it's Saturday afternoon by this time. No traffic in the city because all the shops are shut. So he's just sitting there with his wheels turned right out. So we know he's going to block me, right? So I thought, well, fuck him, he's not going to block me. So as I drove through, I just went whoosh, swooped over to the right-hand side of the road, run over the top of one of them PMG blokes that were, you know, doing them things with all the cage around them. (laughs) took the cage away and reversed it back, threw it in reverse, went back and just spun. How I didn't get hit by a, the government buses coming down, I've got no idea. Because they just come like that as I spun the car around and was facing the wrong way. It was a one-way street, Castle Ray Street. I'm facing up that way towards Arbor Bridge and I got out of the car. They've come out of the back like guns with ballers on. So I knew they weren't cops. Yeah. So the cop takes off, Right. So I go there somewhere and then I end up going down the Lord Nelson Hotel. I got down there and uh, I just sat out there to get my head together. 
And I hid the gun for a while and I sat down and out a couple of beers. I said, right, I'm going to go back to the pub. I'm going to be as calm as a cucumber, right? I'm not going to let anyone know what's gone on there. So that's what I did. And uh, I ended up going back to the pub and here's Ned, right? Now, what was going to happen, the cop was going to drive around the block. Once I'd been shot dead, they'd trap me, right? They pulled up, bang out, shot me. The cop goes around the block, comes around. I uh, found Abbo Henry, he's dead, dead on the side of the road here. Uh, would they take the gun, put it through ballistics? Mm. And, of course, uh, it's going to come up that it's killed three or four people and um, and uh, also shot the policeman. So case oh. closed. They're all through the break. Yes. Flannery, Prendergaster through the break. So is Roger's involvement, right? And Ned had nothing to do with it bar being at some of these. I mean, I was at these meetings when they were taking place, mate. Wow. You know? So, and I just said, you're a pack of fucking lunatics. Right, and I said, yeah, "All you're going to do is bring the house of cards down, mate. We're going to fall, you know. It'll, cr- it'll crush organised crime in Sydney, mate." I said, "Once you start taking it into the public like that and killing coppers, that's a, that, that's crazy shit." So I said, "Leave me out of it, right?" So that that automatically put me in a fucking bad situation. Mm. So they wanted me dead anyway. Mm. You know what I mean? But I didn't care. I didn't care. I wasn't going down that road. And he'd done nothing wrong to fucking me, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. And uh, and I knew it was a bad go, and uh, and I knew everyone who was involved. I wasn't at the meeting. I can't say that I ever saw Roger have a meeting <coughs> with Chris or with Ned about it. But I had meetings with Chris and Ned about it, mm. right? And I told them they were, they were imbeciles uh, doing it, right? And then it happened, and then all that transpired. And then they tried to knock me over it, and I got through the break. So I ended up, I walked back to Ned that day and he's at the Lord Woolsley Hotel in Oldermar where I'd left him. And he, the look on his face when I turned up there, mate, uh, I'd give a thousand for it right here to anyone, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, and he just, seeing he had ghost. this, he just seeing me still here. And I walked back and I said, here's a gun. I give it to him in a paper bag. I said, pull the gun out of the bag. He pulled the gun out of the bag and I said, and it was empty, right? And I said, listen, someone just either tried to kidnap me or murder me, right? And you knew all the fuck about it. And he, mate, he didn't say a word. I said, I'll catch you later. I just walked off, hopped in my car. I drove off. Well, I thought I'd gone. And I went down the road in Bulbar Road and I walked around the street and sat over in one of the old tenement houses there and looked up the street. I waited about an hour, hour and a bit. Down they come. Different cars, of course. Up they pulled. I said, ah, that's who it was driving. That's Prendergast, right? Right. And here's that bloke from the gang. And here's Flannery, right? And then I pulled Roger, right? Wow. So the whole conspiracy was there. In front of your eyes. Yeah, right, right before me. So I went right. So that's when I tried to knock Ned. I tried to kill him at uh, Roselle and uh, the police saved him. And uh, I was laying in the garden. I took Gary over there, actually, and uh, Gary Jibler. And I laid down in the thing and, you know, I mean, you know, I had all the right in the world to take, take his life or what he'd done to me. And, uh, and I was going to take it. And, he's got, and I knew that he wasn't going to drive, that his girlfriend was going to be in the – so I sat, laid down in the garden right beside where his car was. And uh, he walked around, opened up the car door, and as I went to set up, a bull wagon pulled up with detectives on it, like 10 feet away from me, you know, 15, maybe 20 feet, top odds, and said, hey, Ned, you going to that new club down in Balmain? He said, that's where I'm heading now. He said, we'll catch you down there. We'll follow you down. I went, fuck. What are the chances I, of that? I laid down, mate. Like, mate, I could hear me heart. Yeah, boom, I bet. Bang, bang, you know, because the adrenaline was through me. Yeah. I was fucking ready to just fucking unload it, everything, you know. And uh, I would have just em- emptied the old clip into him. And uh, anyway, I got away, had someone waiting for me. Away I went, and I went to the other place where he was. I went up, and I had a wig on and everything, and I, I went down and I pulled, I pulled the bouncer out who I knew. I said, Ray, come here. And he walked out and he said, who the fuck are you? Right? So I had a beard, just like you got. Yeah. And uh, I had long and blonde hair. I said, it's my Abba. He went, oh, Jesus Christ, what are you doing like that? 
I said, listen, do me a favour, go and get Ned and bring him up to the door as if you want to have a talk to him. I said, get him away from them coppers he's drinking with, will you? And I said, because I don't want to have to fucking shoot anyone else. I just want to shoot, oh, mate, he fucking don't do that to me. He fucking near cried, you know. Yeah. He dead near, right? He was a beautiful bloke. Anyway, he said no. Anyway, he must have jerried there was something not right because he knew I'd left the place that night not happy with him. I'd Mm. already been in the pub a bit earlier, right, and I wasn't happy with him and his offsider, right. And so I'd, I'd had a few words with him. So he was on guard anyway. So when he come out, he wasn't on guard when he first walked out of the pub. But when he walked out of that place, he must have had a little bit of a feeling. And uh, the three Sheilas that he went was with, they all turned up. So we had his girlfriend who was driving his car, the mother and the other daughter, and they all got around him and he, he marched in the middle of them like as if you know, it was a shield. You know, I just couldn't believe it. I went, wow. You yeah. know, and they were friends of mine. I couldn't yeah, touch yeah. them. And, uh, and they were women, you know. So I just stopped back in the car and we drove off and I left it for another day. But, you know, there were chances and people say to me, but you had so many chances. You're in the nick with him, you're, you know. I said, yeah, but look, the main thing that I always do is this. I always pretend out in public that... I'm sweet with the bloke. Now, if I see him, even though I know what's happened, I'll go, how are you going? How are you going? And I'll shake his hand, mm. right? And people will go, oh, that's that'd be piss weak. You know what I mean? Well, no, no. It's called using this, mate. It's using the grey matter here, yeah. right? The last thing they ever see you do shaking their hand, you know, saying, oh, I'm on good terms with the bloke officer. Uh, you know, I, I had a drink with him yesterday down at so-and-so. You know what I mean? And Everyone's 100 right. people, were yeah. every, everyone was there. You know, that's like uh, a bloke attacked me one night and I, I jammed a, a knife into him and I yelled out, Put the knife down, mate. Put right. the knife down. Yeah. Well, everyone in the club came out. Next thing he's laying on the ground and I got the knife in my hand. I said, I fucking told you to put it down. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I've already stabbed him. You know, that's how I, I, do, I work things. Uh, you know, how it was used. You've got to be smart. The people. Well, who yeah, if you don't use that, mate, you, you're gonna, you're, yeah. you're not going to live through it. So, so uh, it was all that that I had, you know, and it was just those sort of things that got me through the break and this awareness. I just had this incredible awareness. You know, it's a spiritual awareness. It's something that I'm aware of. My mother taught me about spirit when I was a kid, and I've always believed that your gut feeling is not your gut feeling. Your gut feeling comes through your consciousness and your consciousness is, you know, part of that great divine intelligence, right? That's that's what warns you. That's what gives you this information. It's like trying to pick a horse. You're just sitting there and you go, oh, geez, that jumped out at me. Mm. Bang, and you get on it and it bolts home. It might just mean something to you. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, that's that intelligence. It runs through everything, doesn't it? You know what I mean? Like ants, elephants. Mm. You know what I mean? Uh, it's one intelligence in the universe. And I've always believed in all that stuff. I'm right into it. I've had visitation by spirits. I've had, you know, I can even call upon them, people that I've, to get an answer. Mm. Sometimes they don't turn up with the right answer, they, yeah. you know. But um, I can call upon them. My daughter's got it. She's got it. My mother had it. Right? No one, no one else has got it. My, my wife has seen so many things happen to me over the years that I, I tell her about. Like she come to see me at Cessnock Prison one day and I said, I'm going to tell you before I get out of here, someone's going to try and murder me. Now, I've already had a dream in regards to it. Now, I, I know who it is. I'm going to just tell you they're going to have a go at me. Right? So I'm telling you now, just be aware of it. And she said, oh, you fucking you're paranoid, Graham. You're losing the fucking plot. No, no, I'm fucking losing the plot door. Anyway, two weeks later, a murder out on works release. And there they were. They jumped out, out of the bush, screw dropped me off at the place. I was at Rothbury Train Museum at uh, out the back of Cessna, Hunter Valley. And uh, he drove off and was probably half a mile away when... These two blokes jumped up. I was heading over towards this old train carriage. Uh, they used to do up the old trains there, like from the tra- Granville train disaster or 
Yeah, we've been you know? there for a video we shot. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. You know, well, you know what it's like. There's train carriages everywhere. So I used to work on that, getting the rust off them, shit like that. And I'd drive around the, in the place in an old little car, which was great. You know, I was getting used to driving again and I'd been away six years in prison over the wounding of the police prosecutor, mm-hmm. right? Got eight years because I proved personally he was – he was corrupt as they come. Right. Oh, well, I didn't have to. I mean, it just came out. Came out, yeah. Shit just came out about him. And uh, so, you know, as far as the judge's concerned, it was two criminals up the lane way having a, uh, a brawl, and mm. uh, that's why I got the sense I got. Otherwise, I would have got 20, mm. you know. But uh, anyway, so these two blokes jump up, and exactly who I knew they were, and uh, he's, uh, and I yelled out to him. I said, your father used to be called Uke and I. Who can I tell on? That was his nickname in Glebe. Yeah, right. Right? And I said, who can I tell on? And I said, and it runs in the family, you fucking dog. Because he'd given evidence against me and Ned okay. and I found out about it and he wanted to shut me down. So he told the other crims it was f- on behalf of the cops because of all the ICAC investigation in police corruption, of which I got kicked out of after two and a half years. They kept me in solitary thinking I'd roll over and I got booted out of the inquiry. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I said, mate, you can keep me here for eight years. I'm not going to fucking turn on the police. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not, I've never seen Ned Smith pay the police. If he says that, he said that. You know, and that's common knowledge. But no one knew, really knew. They thought I was doing the same thing. Mm. You know, and I took a big punt even being involved in that. But I did it to protect me, gang. So Ned would, because he'd already talked about everyone, mate. He was giving everyone up. So, I, you know, and myself about crimes that I'd been involved in that he'd, he didn't even do. So all of these things stem from that. Then this bloke saw an opening for a smart lad and went to the police while he was in prison, got taken out on a section 44, they used to call it. I'm pretty sure that was a section and where they can take you into the police station, yep. right, and hold you for 48 hours, right? Well, they didn't hold him at all. Took him down the Cary Hotel in Glebe and they met down there and had a bit of a drink and they said, what's going on out there? He said, oh, this is happening, Ned's saying this, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. And anyway, then he started giving little sly information. Well, when he came back to the prison, he was gone two days. I said, where you been? He was going to another wing and he was been in our wing, right? I said, how come you're going to another wing? He said, oh, I don't know, they just put me there. So I went down and I asked a screw. I said, how come? I said, he just told me he'd just come back from Sewerwater Daily, been to Sewerwater for two days. And uh, then they said, there's no room here. I said, why would they take him here? He said, yeah, I didn't mean to see what, mate. He'd burn out with the police. I said, oh, right. So I went back and I even said to Ned, you know, I said, he, he's been out seeing the cops, that little gunk, right? Mm. Uh, I mean, and I'd even said to this bloke in the yard, listen, we need to do something about Ned, you know, before this long before I became involved. He'd been seeing them nine months before I even come to prison. You know, him and Roy Thurger. Roy Thurger was talking about uh, the coppers setting him up and I told Roy not to get involved in it. And as a result of it, he got murdered. He was shot dead out the front of the laundromat waiting for his wife. And uh, I spoke to him two days before it on the phone. And he said, I've been followed everywhere. I said, I told you, don't get involved in it. Otherwise, they'll put you down, mate. And they did. So they set up some people on regards for it, but it was some... And let the real killer through the break who worked out of green light and worked for the police. You know, so um, that's the way it operated, mate, all of that life. And then they, they, those blokes had a go at me and uh, let go with two uh, thirty eight. Uh, they should have bought nine mils or something with a bit of more accuracy. And uh, all I'd been doing for three months was uh, sprint training. Right. It was like me spirit knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So and you're ready. You know, I, I was just doing this incredible sprint. I was beating blokes, you know, 20 years of age and yeah. I was 47. You know what I mean? So I've always been that way. I've always been competitive. So, you know, even me boxing, me, you know, I even fought at 65 years of age. Did you? You know, for the Australian okay. title. But I ended up snapping me soleus muscle and okay. made me go oh, so red because that's your standard muscle. Yeah. You know, but um, anyway, but, um, you know, that's just in me, so... I, de- I did all them things and then, as I said, they had a go at me and I thought, here we go. Well, they've missed me. Mm. Worst thing you can ever do. So naturally they know I'm going to back up, you know, and so I went hunting them as soon as I got out. 
you know, and I lived in Newcastle and they started hunting me and I started hunting them and I was using binoculars on them and getting pictures of them, the blokes who were coming. There was a couple of little goes up in Newcastle they had a go at me and, uh, and but I, I sprung them and I, I said to one of them, I said, do you want a gunfight or do you want a chance to get out of the scrub you're hiding in and piss off? Because you're hired by a police informer, mate, right? You're hired by a police informer. That's who you'd hide for, hired by, mate, mm. right? So the bike just went, <laughs> took off, right. threw up through the house in Berkeley Street, Spears Point, right? right? So he bolted. And uh, so I said to my wife, I'm going back to Sydney, right? I've got to go down there. I'm going back. We're all moving back. So days in, that was in Lake Macquarie, had moved up to 84. Stayed there till 97 and I went back to Sydney till 2006 and then I came back and I operated for about another four years, about 2010, and then I said, I've had enough. But, uh, you know, during that time there was, I was fronted by Rogerson. He came to me and he said, oh, look, I want to have a power with you and a sit-down and a talk. I'd already had a big meeting. I turned up there on my own in the middle of the America's Cup bar in the Hilton in and they turned up 30 strong. They were riding behind the bars, They, you know. Anyway, they turned up, big table full of them all got around me. And uh, and I just said to the bloke straight out, I know it was you, you little C, right? And he said, no, it wasn't. I said, listen, I'm not stupid, buddy. I've got good intelligence. So I'm just telling you, I know, you know. You either drop off now, you've missed me, I'll give you the opportunity. And they said, all right, we'll just keep out of fucking... Kent Street in the city because they used to drink down at the Captain Cook and a few of them lived around that area. And I said, mate, I'll go any street I like, mm. right? That's the rules. You keep out of mine, right? That's the rules, right? And that's the only rule I'm going to abide by. If I see you in my street, no, you're coming there. Uh, they had a few more go, but then he'd go on a holiday and then someone else would come at me. So I had someone from his own team, he still doesn't know to this day, that was giving me information every time we go on a holiday, you know, I'd know. So I'd know that there was going to be a sneak go on me. So he ended up getting this European gang to get me and um, uh, it got so frustrating for him because I kept taking pictures of him, kept taking, knew all their number plates, you know, I know I'm off by heart still now, you know, yeah, yeah. you know. I don't even know the colours of the car, the number plate being. And I always, because I repeat things like that in my head all the time. So, you know, I keep them there. It's like a repetitive thing. You know, maybe it's a bit of a strange thing, but. It's kept you alive. You know, it's kept me going. So, you know, I've kept all those things. I mean, and look, I don't blame them blokes for coming to have a go at me. They, they thought they were doing something with this bloke who had plenty of uh, goods at the time, plenty of drugs, and they were earning big money off him. You know, he was getting it made and all that sort of stuff. So they were using him up. So they said, yeah, we'll do it for you. Mm. Of course, he was paying them and uh, they weren't going to do it for nothing. But in the end, it got frustrating for him and I rung him up. I just deliberately rung him straight at the, uh, they had a factory. I rung him up at the factory and I said, listen, if I see you here again, if you come to me again, then there's no holding back. I'm giving you the warning. I know this car. I know that car. Here's the number plate. Here's the number plate. Here's the number plate of that one. Know where you are. Know who you are. Right? I'm telling you now you're working for a dog. Just just understand that. That's who you're working for. And uh, next minute they turned up about fucking 10 out. Couldn't believe it. Never seen 10 blokes come to a hit in my life. Yeah. You know what I mean? I said, oh, this is now the new school work, is it? You know? So they come there 10 out. They were up the street, they had Ugg boots on, they were all shaven. Well, at the same time, this same crew tried to take out Mickle Hurley from the other gang because this other bloke, the bloke that I call the clone in my book, I call him the clone. I won't say his name. I'd love to, but, you know, I'll be giving him up for things he's done. So, so I call him the clone. So the little clone, or Napoleon as he's known, as his own gang call him, um, he'd, um, he started running with Mickle and getting his, he got all his contacts through drugs and his nephews and that that were doing stuff and he pulled them on side with him. And then he started getting protection off 
Mark Standen, who was the Assistant Director of the Crime Commission, who's now serving 16 years for importing pseudoethadrine. Now, he was doing the surveillance on me, thinking, you know, and the other cops are coming out doing their normal job, thinking they're just doing surveillance on me for the Crime Commission. But he's passing on that information to the client, right? And they're going to take us out. So there's going to be a big hit. So they go and see Stan Smith, one of the Crime Commission blokes. And they told Stan, the man who I was running around with, who I ran with for 12 years from 97 to 2010. And they said, um, hey, listen, Stan, you, you keep out of this because this has got nothing to do with you. You don't want to get involved. You've retired from the life now. Well, he hadn't really. But, you know, I wouldn't have been still running with him if he had. But, you know, that was a story going around. He turned to God and he'd done this and all He got baptised is all he did. You know what I mean? So um, at the end of the day, they tried and tried, these blokes, and the Crime Commission, given the information where I was, a new place I'd moved to. I even moved, like, sneakily to get to this place. Bang, they found it. You know, and up they started to turn. So I chased a few of them around the place and then one of them one day, I remember walking down the street and he was leaning on the back of a big limousine. They also owned this, you know, they had a bit of money, this crew, mm. you know, and they were pretty professional boys. And I walked down and one of them's, and for some reason I knew not to go down where I usually go and go across the creek because that's where I'd seen them a few times. I used to used to walk across this creek at the back of West Pennant Hills and up the road and up around this oval and do all my training up there, then come back, right? I said, today I'm not going to, I don't like this bloke on the corner. So as I come and I turn around the corner, he's leaning on the back with his arms folded on the boot of this big limo, big white limo. And he said, ah, just doing time, mate, you know what I mean? I said, doing time, mate. That was a funny thing to come out of your mouth. But what you meant to say was, just wasting time, mate. So you've done a bit of nick, eh, mate? I said, listen, tell your friends down the scrub. I'm not going that way today, mate. And off I walked. Oh, I've dumbfounded. Oh, Jesus. Right? So anyway, they turned up and they said, fuck this bloke. So they turned up 10 out to get me. Yeah. I was standing out the front. One of them ran across the road straight at me, like built like a, a hulk he was, this bloke. Run straight across the road at me. I was just standing there. I didn't even have a gun on me. I was just standing out looking around at the street. Next minute this bloke ran out from behind the house because I'd seen all these, this movement. So my youngest daughter at the time had driven around the corner in her little black car that was inside the garage that they didn't know and my wife's out in my Mercedes Benz, which is bulletproof, right? So they think it's Thursday night and I'm out. So they're getting themselves in position for me to come home so they can attack me as I get out of the car because they know it's no good shooting through the window because I knew that they found out that it was bulletproof, right? And uh, so that, that cost about 20 grand to have that done. Right? So anyway, so as one of them ran across a road, next minute he, he got within about 15 feet of me and then realised I'm just standing there in the pitch black. Well, he just spun around like on a sixpence and just took off down the street and started punching trees like in frustration, leaves oh, on branches. Jesus. I said, well, that won't do you any good, mate. <laughs> you know what I mean? So next minute this Sheila walked down the street. They were using women to sit off the house and text everywhere. Yeah, he's leaving. Out the front of the pub, they did the same to Mickle Early. Yeah, he's leaving now. Then they tried to put a hit on him, but a mate of mine was with him and he saved him. You know what I mean? Because he was more smarter than Mick, yeah. you know, on the street. So, um, so we all got together and realised who it was, you know, and then uh, we all put it together and I knew exactly, you know, that the cops were involved. That he, so it got so hard, mate, that um, – so what I did, I trapped them. I trapped them. I, I used to walk around Concord Hospital all around the place. So what I did, I set up – this bloke, a mate of mine, used to be a SAS commando. And he had access to all the best gear you could ever see, surveillance stuff, you know, the nightscapes, the, all the all the grouse, little tiny cameras like that, you know. So we started placing them everywhere, especially this place where I walked. And I said, this is it. This is where he sits off. He used to sit in a kayak on Parramatta River. And as I'd walk around the Concord track, he'd get his girlfriend to walk down with a wig on 
hair all dyed and, you know, whatever it was, over a wig because she was a blonde. He'd, she'd walk past and smile at me, try and lure me. Go, oh, you kidding? You know, she was a good sort. You know, I wasn't falling into that. I'd seen what happened to John Dillinger when I was a kid. You know, he got set up by a woman and she just dropped back and Boom. Marvin Purvis shot him dead. So, you know, what I mean, it wasn't going to happen to me. So, you know, that taught me a good lesson, old John Dillinger, from childhood. So, you know, so anyway, what happened? I so I just jerried. I said, it's going to happen around here somewhere. So I said, and I'm telling you, it's right there where this bamboo is because I've seen them there. I've seen them gather there in an afternoon and this is when they started bringing the European blokes in. They were bringing them with them and I won't say what nationality he was. But anyway, they, they were bringing them there and um, I, I spod them there. So I knew that's where it was going to be. I knew that was where the, the hit was and I used to walk past it all the time and it was real thick bamboo, real thick. And, you know, 30 foot high, mm. right on the bank of the Parramatta River. And uh, so as I'm walking down there, this, this day I'm walking with me little Jack Russell, little Oscar D, I called him, Oscar D La Hoya, <laughs> and uh, tough as males he was. So as we're walking along, if he even seen a tree out of place, he'd stop. You know what I mean? Because we were so used to the area. As we're coming down, he's, he's ears like that. Well, I look through the bamboo. And the bloke, when he used to sit in the kayak, he used to wear one of them hats like the Japs used to wear. So they were in the Philippines in the Second World War and they had the flaps down the back to yep. stop all the sweat and the yep. burn and the sunburn. They had one of them on. Right? And he's sitting, he's squatting, and he's waiting for me to walk past the front of the bamboo patch, which was massive. So I walked around the back of it. Well, as I walked around the back of it, he jerried, you know, that I was on to him. Yeah. And I said, I said to the dog, I said, Oscar, look out for that big mutt, <laughs> right? Well, he's off. He's gone. So what happened? All the, the blue, I just waited. I waited up the thing. Then I come back. What happened? The blue van, blue van come around, all blacked out windows. They parked and they all talked. And I got them all on video, a whole lot of them, and all talking. They were hidden under leaves, mate, These little, all these tiny microphones, mate. Right. Unbelievable. Little Frodians, they are. Yeah. You know, he had the best stuff, this bloke. So I got him cold as toast. I could use it any day of the week if yeah. I ever wanted to. Yeah. I never have and I never will. But, uh, you know, that. so that, that's how I operated. And it saved me. Uh, look, the reason I didn't go and get him, and I, I tried early and I had him in the sights a few times, but, you know, he'd just he'd get out of the way, you know. So And then he'd leave another entrance and, uh, stuff me, and that was at Piermont, and I had him, and I was riding the lane down the road, and I was sitting up on the corner. They knew I, I'd already been to the pub and threatened a few blokes in the pub a few days before it, and uh, I just said, if you want to fight, well, let's do it, you know. But anyway, so in the end, I jerried that because of the Crime Commission and all the people involved, and like no one from my team that I was running around with then, Stan, I mean, Stan was 75, you know, he was getting on, even though he was a very good 75, you know. And then I had another bloke, you know, he'd never been involved in killing people and shooting people. So no one ever put up their hand to say, well, we're going to give you a backup here. No one ever has. I've done everything on me, Pat Malone, all my life, you know. One bloke out of the whole of them was just only ever put up his hand. And then I joined with another crew at one stage to work it out. But when we realised the Crime Commission were on board and they were doing surveillance on us and they were involved as well and they'd been picking up me cigarette butts in pubs, right, that's what they were going to use for the DNA. Right. So, yeah. so I blew it up in the papers. I went to the crime reporters that I knew and I blew it up in the papers that they were picking up me cigarette butts to use for DNA. So if he was to be found dead, they knew that I was smart enough to, to get away with what I was going to do, right, and no one would have seen me. And, uh, and, I mean, the best description ever given to me that I was 53 of German appearance. So right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and that come out in royal commissions and stuff, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so, uh, you know, I mean, because I wore disguises, I was pretty good at it. And uh, I'd been doing it since I was a, you know, young bloke. I mean, I'd been robbing banks since I was 15. So, you know, I'd, um, you know, so I, I always just had that, I don't know, you know, people call it street smart. I don't. I just call it that. That 
that mad awareness I had. It sounds like you had massive you know, intuition into you know, what's happening I, I around just, you all the I time. I did, you know, and, and it's what uh, survived all those attempts and um, even today, mate, I get up, I, I watch everything. So what do you do now? You've, you've retired yeah, from your retired previous life? Yeah, I've retired, mean, mate, I'm just uh, selling my book at the moment, yeah. as I say, uh, Last Man Standing. And where can they get that again? Uh, uh, treacherouslife.com, yep. and I'll sign it for you. And I, I just do a little bit of social media stuff that I've, I've been just getting used to. Uh, you know, a bit funny looking at your own dial it every is. couple of days. You get used to it, though. You know what I mean? But you get used to it. So but, where can uh, people find you on social media as uh, well? Just on, on the Instagram and that, and they can yep. uh, find me on there. I'm, uh, I do a reel every now and then. I've talked about different stuff and different subjects and um, uh, mainly a little bits about the book uh, here and there. I don't tell them everything or I, I talk about some maniac that I knew during in my life, uh, as I did the other day, I talked about a bloke called Jimmy Formica, who was probably the maddest human being ever met. He was Sicilian. And uh, I'll tell you the story because it's funny. And, uh, I mean, he wasn't a funny bloke. He was a dangerous bloke. He was uh, violent. He was a mad rapist. And um, he used to dig graves by hand at Botany Cemetery in the old days. Right. And... Uh, what he'd do of a night, he'd go around to wherever the dancers were in the around the, that area, say Botany or, you know, all around there, Cogra, where, wherever it was, and uh, take them out, put them on the grave, kidnap them from the dance of women, take them out and put them on the grave that he just dug that week and rape them on that. Well, they'd be horrified they were even in the graveyard, so they'd never open their mouth. Mm. So he was well known for it. And he was tough and he was and he was – like just a, a nut. Uh, I remember going into a club one night and I attacked this bloke who attacked me and uh, he attacked me. Well, I left him with about, you know, 20 holes in him. Right? And uh, that for Mike, I said to another bloke, he said, fuck, he's madder than me. Right? But, you know, the truth was that he was right off the planet, this bloke. So a mate of mine bashes him, a bloke called Billy McLean. who was a friend of mine at the time. If I had to think about him now... I, uh, he was. A, he ended up being a pedophile, and uh, none of us knew that. We're all in prison with him. We all thought he was a tough guy, but anyway, he ended up killing himself and killing his wife. And uh, you know, the poor kid still lives with it all. So, anyway, that happened over at Dora Creek. But uh, anyway, he um, he was one of these blokes who was just tough. He couldn't fight, but he was tough. Anyway, he'd, fl- he'd flogged this uh, cousin of Jimmy Formica's. And he was walking through Taverners Hill in Leichhardt one day along Parramatta Road and Jimmy's coming back from working out the graves and then he usually used to go and work with his father in the uh, bakery at Leichhardt. So as he's driving along, he sees Billy walking along. He pulled up and he said, Hey, Billy, you and me, we fight. We fight down the road, down the lane where they And Billy said, Yeah, good as God. So he starts to walk down. When he looks back, he's... Here's for Mike at the boot of the car, pulling out two picks. Got one pick over his shoulder, another pick over the other shoulder and just starts walking down. He's going, what are, you, what are you doing, Jim? He said, yeah, here's one for you, one for me. Let's fight like the animals we are. He said, fucking <laughs> no way, mate. No way. He fucking shit himself. I can so, imagine. You know, Jesus uh, Christ. He, he was. Anyway, a uh, mate of mine uh, who's dead now, so I can mention it, his name was Henry Charles Landini, an Italian bloke. He was from the north of Italy. He was from the south. He sold him a pound of iron and uh, Jimmy refused to pay for it. He was working on the door at the Pudisham Inn at, uh, uh, Leica, uh, in, just in Pudisham there. And uh, he was a bouncer there. Anyway, Danny pulls up and uh, his car was seen leaving the scene. I don't know why he was never pinched, but he was probably pretty sweet himself in those days. So... He walked down and um, he said, listen, I need my money. He had two other blokes with him. And he said, "Uh, I want my money for the gear. He said, you'll get fucked. I not pay you, Mm. you know. You'll fucking piss off, you little bastard, you know. So he started abusing him down as he got up the street. He got out of the way of the darkness, you know what I mean, where it was dark up the street. Mm. And for Mike, had just started walking up there. Well, that was the silliest thing he ever did to... They just emptied, you know, 11 shots into him and he just kept walking at him. <laughs> he even said to me after, he said, well, fucking horrified, couldn't oh believe he God. wouldn't go down. Wow. But in the end he did, you know, and uh, but that was the end of him. 
Jimmy James, I might go, yeah, what a wow. lunatic he was. Mate, I tell you what, some of the stories, you know, we this podcast could go for six hours. Oh, and I, I tell you really? what I'd like to do, maybe in a couple of months, three or yeah. four months, I'd love to have Gary come on the show and maybe yeah. you come on as well yeah. and we'll have a big chat about yeah, everything that was family. happening there because Gary also has a lot of information from the police side oh, of things. That's and right, I, exactly right. I think that would be very interesting. Yeah. But I tell you what, mate, I really appreciate your time. Uh, no Thank problem, you, mate. I appreciate that. My and pleasure. Go and follow Graham on – what was what is your name on Instagram? Uh, I think it's just Graham Henry okay. seven four something something, something like, like that. But I'll, I'll share it on my Instagram as well. And uh, yeah. th- thank you, brother. I appreciate yeah, time. No, no problem. Go and check out the book as well. The links will be down below, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time, and thank you, sir. No worries, mate. Legend. Appreciate it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I am on tour right now. Live comedy is back. I'm going across the country and New Zealand in 2022, and I want to see you there. I want to make you laugh. I want to make you smile, and I I want to offend you. Head to isaacbutterfield.com forward slash tickets right now. Okay, that's where you need to go get your tickets. They are selling out fast. Live stand-up comedy is back. The Buttsman is back, and I am absolutely pumped to come to your part of the world. World.